as to why they wish a little longer as well at the beginning. I now come to the statement. Prime Minister. Yeah. With your permission, I would like to make a statement in this statement. But firstly, I want to say sorry. And I'm sorry for the things we simply didn't get right, and also sorry for the way that this matter has been handled. And it's no use saying that this or that was within the rules, and it's no use saying that people were working hard. This pandemic was hard for everyone. We asked people across this country to make the most extraordinary sacrifices, not to meet loved ones, not to visit relatives before they died. And I understand the anger that people feel. But, Mr Speaker, it isn't enough to say sorry. This is a moment when we must look at ourselves in the mirror and we must learn. And while the Metropolitan Police must yet complete their investigation, and that means there are no details of specific events in Sue Gray's report, I, of course, accept Sue Gray's general findings in full. And above all, her recommendation that we must learn from these events and act now. With respect to the events under police investigation, she says, and I quote, no conclusions should be drawn or inferences made from this other than it is now for the police to consider the relevant material in relation to those incidents. But more broadly, she finds that there is significant learning to be drawn from these events, which must be addressed immediately across government. This does not need to wait for the police investigations to be concluded. That is why we are making changes now to the way Downing Street and the Cabinet Office run, so that we can get on with the job that I was elected to do, Mr Speaker, and the job that this Government was elected to do. First, it is time to sort out what Sue Gray rightly calls the fragmented and complicated leadership structures of Downing Street, which she says have not evolved sufficiently to meet the demands of the expansion of Number 10. And we will do that including by creating an office of the Prime Minister with a permanent secretary to lead number 10. Second, Mr Speaker, it is clear from Sue Gray's report that it is time not just to review the Civil Service and Special Advisor Codes of Conduct wherever necessary to ensure that they take account of Sue Gray's recommendations, but also to make sure that those codes are properly enforced. And third, I will be saying more in the coming days about the steps we will take to improve the Number 10 operation and the work of the Cabinet Office, to strengthen Cabinet Government and to improve the vital connection between Number 10 and Parliament. Mr Speaker, I get it and I will fix it. And I want to say... And I want to say to the people of this country, I know what the issue is. Yes, Mr Speaker, yes, yes. It's whether this government can be trusted to deliver. And I say, Mr Speaker, yes, we can be trusted. Yes, we can be trusted to deliver. We said that we would get Brexit done, Mr Speaker, and we did. And we're setting up three ports around the whole United Kingdom. I've been to one of them today, which is creating tens of thousands of new jobs, Mr Speaker. We said we would get this country through COVID, and we did. We delivered the fastest vaccine rollout in Europe and the fastest booster programme of any major economy, so that we've been able to restore people's freedoms faster than any comparable economy. And at the same time, we've been cutting crime by 14 per cent, building four 40 new hospitals and rolling out gigabit broadband, Mr Speaker, and delivering all the promises of our 2019 agenda so that we have the fastest economic growth of the G7. We have shown that we have done things that people thought were impossible, Mr Speaker, and, and that we can deliver for the British people. Mr Speaker, I, just, I remind the, the, the benches opposite. The reason we're coming out of COVID so fast is at least partly because we doubled the speed of the booster rollout. And I can tell the House and this country that we are going to bring the same energy and commitment to getting on with the job, to delivering for the British people 
and to our mission to unite and level up across this country, Mr. Speaker, and I commend this statement to the House. I now call Keir Starmer, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank Sue Gray for the diligence and professionalism with which she's carried out her work. It's no fault of hers that she's only been able to produce an update today, not the full report. The Prime Minister repeatedly assured the House that the guidance was followed and the rules were followed. But we now know that 12 cases have reached the threshold for criminal investigation, which I remind the House means that there is evidence of serious and flagrant breaches of lockdown, including, including the party on the 20th of May 2020, which we know the Prime Minister attended, and the party on the 13th of November 2020 in the Prime Minister's flat. There can be no doubt that the Prime Minister himself is now subject to criminal investigation. The Prime Minister must keep his promise to publish Sue Gray's report in full when it is available, but it is already clear that the report discloses the most damning conclusion possible. Over the last two years, the British public have been asked to make the most heart-wrenching sacrifices, a collective trauma endured by all, enjoyed by none. Funerals have been missed, dying relatives unvisited. Every family has been marked by what we've been through. And revelations about the Prime Minister's behaviour have forced us all to rethink and relive those darkest moments. Many have been overcome by rage, by grief, and even guilt. Guilt that because they stuck to the law, they did not see their parents one last time. Guilt that because they didn't bend the rules, their children went months without seeing friends. Guilt that because they did as they were asked, they didn't go and visit lonely relatives. But people shouldn't feel guilty. They should feel pride in themselves and their country, because by abiding by those rules, They've saved the lives of people they will probably never meet. They have shown the deep public spirit and the love and respect for others that has always characterised this nation at its best. Our national story about COVID is one of a people that stood up when they were tested. But that will be forever tainted by the behaviour of this Conservative Prime Minister. By routinely breaking the rules he set, the Prime Minister took us all for fools. He held people sacrificing contempt. He showed himself unfit for office. His desperate denials since he was exposed have only made matters worse. Rather than come clean, every step of the way, he's insulted the public's intelligence. And now he's finally fallen back on his usual excuse. It's everybody's fault but his. They go, he stays. Even now, he is hiding behind a police investigation into criminality, into his home and his office. Mr Speaker, he gleefully treats what should be a mark of shame as a welcome shield. But, Prime Minister, the British public aren't fools. They never believed a word of it. They think the Prime Minister should do the decent thing and resign. Of course he won't, because he is a man without shame. And just as he has done throughout his life, he's damaged everyone and everything around him along the way. His colleagues have spent weeks defending the indefensible touring the TV studios, parroting his absurd denials, degrading themselves and their offices, fraying the bond of trust between the government. Oh, oh. The member for South Ribble is my neighbour. I expect better from my neighbours. Kirsten. Fraying the bond of trust between the government and the public, eroding our democracy and the rule of law. Margaret Thatcher once said, The first duty of government is to uphold the law. If it tries to bob, 
and weave and duck around that duty when it's inconvenient, then so will the governed. Mr Speaker, to govern this country is an honour, not a birthright. It is an act of service to the British people, not the keys to a court to parade to your friends. It requires honesty, integrity and moral authority. I can't tell you how many times people have said to me that this Prime Minister's lack of integrity is somehow priced in, that his behaviour and character don't matter. I have never accepted that, and I never will accept that. Whatever your politics, whichever party you vote for, honesty and decency matters. Our great democracy depends on it, and cherishing and nurturing British democracy is what it means to be patriotic. There are members opposite who know that, and they know the Prime Minister is incapable of it. The question they must now ask themselves is what are they going to do about it? They can heap their reputations, the reputation of their party, the reputation of this country on the bonfire that is his leadership, or they can spare the country from a Prime Minister totally unworthy of his responsibilities. It is their duty to do so. They know better than anyone how unsuitable he is for high office. Many of them knew in their hearts that we would inevitably come to this one day. And they know that as night follows day, continuing his leadership will mean further misconduct, cover-up and deceit. It is only they that can end this farce. The eyes of the country are upon them. They will be judged by the decisions they take now. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, there's there's a reason why he said absolutely nothing about the report uh, that was presented uh, by by this government and later put in the Library of the House earlier on today. That is because, Mr Speaker, the report does absolutely nothing to substantiate the tissue of nonsense uh, he has just spoken. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Instead, Mr Speaker, this, this Leader of the Opposition, a former Director of Public Prosecutions, Mr Speaker, will tell you he spent most of his time prosecuting journalists and failing to prosecute Jimmy Savile, as far as I can make out, Mr Speaker. He, Mr Speaker, chose to use, the, chose to use this moment he used this moment, Mr. Speaker, continually to prejudge a police inquiry. That's what he chose to do. Uh, he, he's reached his conclusions about it. I am not going to reach any conclusions, and he, and he would be entirely, and entirely wrong to do so. And, and I direct him again, Mr. Speaker, to what uh, Sue Gray says in her in her report about the conclusions that can be drawn uh, from. Uh, her inquiry about what the police may or may not do. Now, Mr Speaker, I have complete confidence uh, in the police and I hope that they will, uh, they will be allowed simply to get on with their job and I don't propose to offer any more commentary about it and I don't believe that he should either. And I, I must say to him uh, that what I, think the, and, and, uh, what I think the country, with greatest respect to the benches opposite, what I think the country wants us all in this House to focus on is the issues that matter to them. Getting on, Mr. Speaker, with taking this country forward, and, and Mr. Speaker, uh, today uh, we have delivered yet more Brexit freedoms with a new Freeport uh, in Tilbury. As I said, when he voted 48 times to take this country back into the uh, to the EU, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have the most open society, most open economy. Mr. Speaker, this is, I think, what people want us to focus on. We have the most open society, most open economy in Europe because of the vaccine rollout, because of the booster rollout. And never forget, Mr. Speaker, that he voted, uh, he voted to keep us in the European Medicines Agency, which would have made that impossible. And today, Mr. Speaker, we are standing together with our NATO allies against the potential aggression of Vladimir Putin when he wanted, not so long ago, to install a Prime Minister, as Prime Minister, a Labour leader who would actually have abolished NATO, Mr Speaker. That's what he believes in. Those are his priorities. Well, I can say to him, he can continue with his political opportunism. We are going to get on, and I am going to get on with the job. Theresa May. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Covid regulations 
impose significant restrictions on the freedoms of members of the public. They had a right to expect their Prime Minister to have read the rules, to understand the meaning of the rules, and indeed those around, them to have done, around him to have done so too, and to set an example in following those rules. What the Grey Report does show is that Number 10 Downing Street was not observing the regulations they had imposed on members of the public. So either my right honourable friend had not read the rules, or didn't understand what they meant, and others around him, or they didn't think the rules applied to Number 10. Which was it? My right honourable friend. It's a very important question. I want to hear the answer, even if other people don't. Prime Minister. Uh, no, Mr. Speaker, that is not what the uh, Grey Report says. Uh, Says. Uh, but if she, I, 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 I suggest that she waits to see uh, the conclusion of the inquiry. I now come to the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I say it's a pleasure to follow the former Prime Minister and perhaps her behaviour in office, like many that f went before her, was about dignity, about the importance of the office, of respect of truthfulness, and the Prime Minister will be well advised to focus on those that have not dishonoured the office like he has done. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, we stand here today faced with the systematic decimation of public trust in government and the institutions of the state, and at its heart, a Prime Minister, a Prime Minister being investigated by the police. So here we have it. The long-awaited Sue Gray report. What a farce. It was carefully engineered to be a fact-finding exercise with no conclusions. Now we find it's a fact-finding exercise with no facts. <laughs> so let's talk facts. The Prime Minister has told the House that all guidance was completely followed. There was no party. COVID rules were followed and that I believed it was a work event. Nobody, nobody believed them then. And nobody, nobody believes you now, Prime Minister. That is the crux. No ifs, no buts. He has willfully, willfully misled Parliament. It's bad enough. Oh, 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 oh. Order! Inadvertent. Misled the House will be acceptable. Misled the House is not acceptable. So, so, uh, Withdraw inadvertently. The Prime Minister inadvertently told the House on the 8th of December that no parties had taken place and then had to admit that they had. It's bad enough, Mr. Speaker, that the Prime Minister's personal integrity is in the ditch, but this murky business is tainting everything around it. It is our intention to submit a motion instructing the Prime Minister to publish the Great Report in full. Will the Prime Minister obey an instruction by this House to publish as required? Mr Speaker, amidst allegations of blackmail by Tory whips, the members opposite have been defending the indefensible. Wait for the report, we were told. Well, here it is, and it tells us very little, except it does state that there were failures of leadership and judgment by different parts of number 10. It states that some events should not have been allowed to take place. That is the Prime Minister's responsibility. If there is any honour, any honour in public life, then he would resign. Where is this? And he laughs. And the Prime Minister laughs. We ought to remind ourselves in this House and 150,000 plus of our citizens have lost their lives. Family members that couldn't be with them. And that is the sight that people will remember. A Prime Minister laughing at our public. I extend the hand of friendship to all those that have sacrificed. I certainly do not extend the hand of friendship to the Prime Minister, who is no friend of mine. Where is the shame? Where is the dignity? Meanwhile, the police investigation will drag on and on. Every moment the Prime Minister stays, trust in government 
and the rule of law is ebbing away. The litany of rule breaking, the culture of contempt, the utter disdain for the anguish felt by the public who have sacrificed so much. What the public see is a man who has debased the office of Prime Minister, shrinked responsibility, dogged accountability and blamed his staff at every turn, presided over sleaze and corruption and tainted the very institutions of the state. In short, Mr Speaker, this is a man... Well, they can laugh. They can laugh. But the public know. The public know this is a man they can no longer trust. He has been investigated by the police. He misled the House. He must now resign. Order. You'll have to withdraw that last comment. Mr Speaker, I gave the evidence of the 8th of December. And, oh, order. Order. You're going to have to withdraw misled. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister has misled the House. Unless you withdraw, I will have to stop, and that's not good. Just withdraw the words. I am standing up for my constituents that know that this Prime Minister has lied and misled the House. Give me the paper. Give me the paper. Inadvertently misled. I'll give you one more chance. As leader of the SNP, I don't want to have to throw you out. I'm going to give you this chance. Please. Please to power. That man has misled the House. Shut up. I'm sorry it's come to this, and I'm sorry that the leader of the party has not got the decency to just withdraw those words in order that this debate can be represented by all political leaders. Would you like to inadvertently? If the Prime Minister has inadvertently misled the House, then I will state that. Right, we're going to leave it at that. <laughs> Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I, I, I'm grateful to the uh, Right Honourable Gentleman for withdrawing uh, what he just said because he was wrong then and uh, he, I'm afraid, is wrong in, the, in, in his, his analysis. And I, 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 I apologise, as I've said, for uh, all the suffering that people have had throughout this pandemic and, uh, and for the anger that people feel uh, about uh, what has taken place in, in Number 10 Downing Street. But I've got, I've got to tell the, uh, the right honourable gentleman that for much of what he said, uh, his best course is simply to wait for the, uh, for the inquiry to be completed. Can I just say, I take it the honourable member has withdrawn it, the right honourable member. That the Prime Minister may have inadvertently misled the House. But, no. should, or, order. To help me, to help the House, you withdraw withdrawn your earlier comment and replaced it with inadvertently. It's not my fault if the Prime Minister can't be trusted to tell the truth. Under the power given to me by Standing Order No. 43, I order the Honourable Member to withdraw immediately from the House. From the House. Remain. It's, it's, it's all right, we don't need to bother. Right, let us move on. Andrew Mitchell. Does my right honourable friend recall? that uh, ever since he joined the party's candidates list 30 years ago, until we got him into number 10, he has enjoyed my full-throated uh, support. But I am deeply concerned by these events, and, and very concerned indeed by some of the things he has said from that dispatch box and has said to the British public and our constituents. When he kindly invited me to see him 10 days ago, I told him that I thought he should think very carefully about what was now in the best interests of our country and of the Conservative Party. And I have to tell him he no longer enjoys my support. Well, uh, Ms. Mr Speaker, I, I must tell uh, respectfully uh, my right honourable friend, great though uh, the admiration uh, is that I have of him, I, I simply think that he's uh, mistaken in his views. And, uh, I, I urge him, to, I urge him to, to reconsider upon full consideration of the, of the inquiry. Dame Angela Riedel. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister told us, and I'm quoting him, I have repeatedly been assured since these allegations emerged that there was no party and that no Covid rules were broken. We now know that 
12 of the 16 parties are subject to a police investigation, and that of the remaining four, the Sue Gray report says this, that she's seen a serious failure to observe the high standards at number 10. She's seen failures of leadership, failures of judgment, and the Prime Minister thinks this is fine. So just how bad do things have to be before he takes personal responsibility, does what everybody in this country wants him to do, and resign? Uh, Mr Speaker, what we are doing is taking the action that I have described uh, to set up a Prime Minister's Department to improve the operation uh, of Number 10, and we will be taking further steps, Mr Speaker, in, uh, in the days ahead. Graeme Stewart. Speaker, the uh, inquiry has found there have been serious failings and has suggested there be changes in the, uh, the way that uh, Number 10 is run, and there is a real opportunity now to take forward this new office of the Prime Minister and ensure further Im improvements are made so that we can carry on delivering, because what the party's opposite hate is the fact that this government will carry on delivering on the things that matter most to people, while also making sure that the governance within Number 10 is improved. I thank my right honourable friend very, very much. I think he's completely right. I do think that uh, the opposition, uh, of course, uh, want to keep the, uh, their focus trained uh, on this. That's, the, that's their decision. I think, Mr. Speaker, I think, Mr. Speaker, what the people of this country want us to do is to get on with the job that they want us to do, and that is to serve them, Mr. Speaker, and to stop talking, frankly, about ourselves. Mr. Speaker, there is no word in the English language for a parent who has lost a child. No equivalent of widow or orphan for that particular horror. It is a loss that is literally beyond words, a loss that hundreds and thousands of parents have tragically experienced during this pandemic. Many had to bury their children alone. Many couldn't be there with them at the end. Meanwhile, number 10 parted. Yep. Does the Prime Minister understand? Does he care about the enormous hurt his actions have caused to bereaved families across our country? Will he finally accept that the only decent thing that he can do now is to resign? Uh, Mr Speaker, I do care deeply about the hurt that is felt ar across the country uh, about the suggestion that uh, things were going on in number 10 that were in contravention of the, of the COVID rules. And I understand how deeply people feel about this and how angry uh, that they are. And, and, I, and I've apologised uh, several times, Mr Speaker, but I must say that I think we should wait for the outcome of the inquiry by, before jumping to the conclusions uh, that he has. And in the meantime, we should focus on the issues that matter to the British people. Caroline Notes. Speaker. The public and this House have been frustrated by having to wait for Sue Gray, wait for the Metropolitan Police, and today the Prime Minister has announced his new office at number 10. Please can you let this House know what specific structures are going to be put in place so that this House can hold it accountable? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, we will make sure that there is a new Permanent Secretary uh, to who will be accountable uh, to me. Uh, and uh, we will make sure that the codes of conduct that are applied both to SPADs and to uh, civil servants are properly enforced. And, of course, uh, all of that will be properly communicated to the, to the House, Mr Speaker. And what I want to see is much better uh, communication and, uh, and links between uh, Number 10 and the entirety of the House of Commons. And we will do that. Sir George Howard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, at the local... Tesco store in my constituency, a constituent asked me, and it was in a tone more in sorrow than in anger, why doesn't the Prime Minister realise that as every day goes by, he damages the reputation of our country yes. and, uh, abroad and around the world? Why, he said, doesn't the Prime Minister realise that? How would he respond to that constituent? Uh, Mr Speaker, I think the reputation of our country around the world is built on the fastest vaccine rollout uh, in Europe, if not in all major economies. Uh, it is built on having the fastest growth, therefore, in the G7, 
and it is built on our ability to bring, uh, bring our allies together to stand up against Vladimir Putin. That is what the world is focused on, that is what I am focused on, and that, frankly, is what he should be focused on. Sir Bernard Jenkin. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Can my right hon. Friend, first of all, uh, remind the Leader of the Opposition and the Labour Party that the backbenches of the Conservative Party need no reminders about how to dispose of a failing leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and can he can he can he also can he also, when he is restructuring number ten, concentrate on the fact that the country wants results. The country we can't see the point of such a large number ten superstructure. That it needs to be slimmed down and streamlined. And can I commend his determination to restore to restore cabinet to restore cabinet government and it is on results over the next few months on which he will be judged. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank uh, my right honourable friend very much for that, and I, I think he's entirely right. And I'm uh, more than content to be judged, Mr. Speaker, on the results that we've already delivered and the results that we will deliver. I'm sure that we will be greatly assisted uh, by the reforms of Number 10 uh, that I've outlined. Diane Abbott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Anybody who's actually read the Sue Gray report can only wonder what she was made to leave out. Will the Prime Minister give the House an undertaking that as soon as he is able, he will release the full, unredacted report to this House? Uh, Mr Speaker, Sue Gray has published uh, everything uh, that she can, and I propose that we wait until the conclusion of the, of the inquiry. Uh, but in the meantime, Mr Speaker, I think it... Uh, I think it peculiar that the report is being simultaneously uh, hailed as, as utterly damning, uh, but also uh, condemned for not uh, having enough in it. Um, it, can't, it can't be both. Vital fabricant. President Truman had on his desk, the buck stops here. So the Prime Minister was right to apologise for the events that happened in Number 10 Downing Street. Two weeks ago, I reminded Tom Harwood that Tony Blair suggested that there should be an Office of Prime Minister so that it could be governed not from 70 Whitehall but from the building itself. Could the Prime Minister tell me how he envisions the office will work? Will the Permanent Secretary be based in Number 10, controlling what civil servants do in Number 10? I, I'm grateful to, to my, my honourable friend, uh, very grateful. I think the House does understand, even if many people outside uh, don't, that Number 10 actually uh, hosts about more than 400 officials uh, on, a, on a busy day. Uh, they have a huge amount uh, to do, and, and we need to make sure, we need to make sure, no, Mr Speaker, they're working very hard. That's what they're doing. Uh, and, and we need to make sure uh, that there are proper lines of authority and that we sort out the, the command structures, and that's what we're doing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Whatever the police decide, this uh, update, severely limited as it is, would be enough to persuade any other Prime Minister to resign. Yeah. 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 This Prime Minister could resign and salvage, salvage for himself a crumb or two of honour, or he may try to, dismay, to delay and take his party down with him. So, Mr Speaker, is it not clear that, with notable exceptions, his backbenchers should discover their backbones and sack him? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, Mr Speaker, I've, I've, I've answered several questions like that, and I, just, I must really ask him to look at the uh, report properly and also to wait uh, for the inquiry when it comes. Al Carper. Thank you very much, um, Mr Speaker. Um, we've been asked to keep some sense of perspective, and I think that's... Right. The question here is whether those who make the law obey the law. That's pretty fundamental. Um, uh, many have questioned, including some of my constituents, the Prime Minister's honesty and integrity and fitness to hold that office. Now, in judging him, he rightly asked us to wait for all the facts. Sue Gray has made it clear in her update today that she couldn't produce a meaningful report 
with the facts. <coughs> so can I ask the Prime Minister the question that the Honourable Lady, the member for Hackney North and Stoke Newington, asked him and to which he didn't give an answer. When Sue Gray produces all of the facts in her full report after the police investigation, will he commit to publish it immediately and in full? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, what we've got to do, uh, Sue Gray, is, is, is wait for the... Wait for the wait for, uh, wait for the police to conclude their inquiries, Mr. Speaker. That is the proper thing to do. People have given uh, all sorts of evidence in the expectation that it would not necessarily uh, be published, Mr. Speaker. Uh, at that stage, I will take a decision about what to publish, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I imagine that I'm going to be asked to wait for something else. Um, but can I just simply ask the Prime Minister, was the Prime Minister present at the event in his flat on the 13th of November? I assume he doesn't need other people to tell him whether he was there or not. Um, was he at the flat event listed in the report on the 13th of November? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm very grateful to the uh, uh, Honourable Lady for inviting me to, to comment on something that is uh, being investigated. Uh, but I, 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 with great respect to her, I am simply not going to indulge in running commentary. She will have to wait, Mr Speaker. Sir Robert Butland, Mr Speaker, saying sorry is very important. But my right honourable friend will be judged by the deeds that he undertakes as a result. I heard today a proper acknowledgement that he needs to look in the mirror. And I'm glad to hear about reforms to the centre of government that I think are timely. In fact, they're overdue, as he knows from previous conversations I've had with him. But will he give me and the House this undertaking today that in cooperating with the Metropolitan Police Inquiry, he will show uh, the appropriate tone and approach that I think the British public demand of him uh, as, as a person of serious purpose who is up to the level of events. That's what we expect from him now, and that's what I'll be expecting him to do. I, I thank uh, my right honourable friend very much, and I just want to stress, Mr Speaker, that I, I have great admiration for the Metropolitan Police and full confidence in the police. And I, 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 I just suggest that they be allowed now to get on with their job. Culture, no? Thank you, Mr Speaker. We now know that there's a criminal investigation into the party that took place on the 13th of November 2020 in his flat to celebrate the exit of Mr Cummings. On the 8th of December last year, he came to that dispatch box and flatly denied the very idea that any such party had taken place. He's shaking his head in answer to my honourable friend, the member for Holmesy and Wood Green, he said it had not happened. Yeah. Yeah. Now, he's inadvertently, Mr Speaker, misled the House. So the very least he should do is get to that dispatch box yeah. and correct the record. Yeah. Yeah. No, Mr Speaker, I stand by what I said and I would urge and I would simply urge him I would simply urge him to wait for the outcome of the of the inquiry. That's what he needs to do. Dr Julian Lewis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I advise my right honourable friend publicly what I have said to emissaries from his campaign team privately, <laughs> that it is truly in his interest, in the government's interest, and in the national interest that he should insist on receiving the full, unredacted report immediately, as I believe he can, and that he should then publish the uncensored version without any further delay. Well, I, I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend, but uh, I think extensive legal <coughs> advice has been taken uh, on this point, and uh, Sue Gray has published everything uh, that she thinks she can that is consistent with that advice. Joanna Chari. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, if the police investigation were to result in serious criminal charges, 
necessitating a criminal trial, such as, I don't know, for example, misconduct in public office or conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. How would the Prime Minister feel about having to give evidence on oath? <laughs> Mrs. Speaker, I'm not going to uh, speculate about hi hypothetical uh, 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 questions which, which, frankly, I reject. Well, Richard, Mr. Speaker, you will know that it's a very rare event for any Prime Minister to come to this House and apologise. Mm. Uh, a difficult thing for any well, Prime Minister uh, to do. But on the issue of the police investigation, does my right honourable friend agree with me that there should be due process, that there should be free and unfettered access to all at number 10, but most of all there should be no prejudging or undermining of the police inquiry before it's concluded? Yes, I, I completely agree, and I must say I'm shocked by some of the commentary that I've heard uh, from the benches opposite about that matter today, Mr Speaker. Chris Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The thing is, this is who the Prime Minister is. Yeah. A serious failure to observe high standards, yeah. failures of leadership and judgment, excessive consumption of alcohol in a professional workplace, gatherings that should have not have been able to take place, staff too frightened to raise concerns, parties in his own private flat. A leopard doesn't change its spots, does it? Every single one who defends this will face this again and again and again, because he still won't even admit to the House that when he came to us on the 13th of November and said the guidance and the rules were followed at all times, and on the 1st of December that all the guidelines were observed, that those things simply were not true. If he won't correct the record today, there's nothing accidental about this, is there? Mm. It's deliberate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what he's trying to say, Mr Speaker, but oh. look, 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 I direct him again to the uh, point made by Sue Gray uh, that no conclusions should be drawn or inferences made uh, from this other than it is now time for the police to consider the relevant material. And that is what the House should allow them, frankly, to do. Shall we swap? Speaker, it is absolutely right that over the past few weeks our constituents across the House have been writing to us on this hugely important issue, and I don't in any way wish to minimise its importance. But in my constituency, I have military bases, and I am receiving emails from families who are concerned about their loved ones and the potential role they may end up playing given the conflict on the Russian-Ukrainian border. Yep, yep, yep. Members opposite may <coughs> treat this lightly, but for the families, but families who have those serving in the military do not treat it lightly. Would my right honourable friend give me an assurance that notwithstanding the importance of the issue that we are discussing at present, his government will start addressing other important matters that concern my constituents and the constituents of people across this House. Yeah. Thank him very much indeed, and I think he's completely right. That the, of course these matters are important, we've got to wait for the, uh, for the inquiry, but in the meantime the UK has got to play uh, the leading role that we are, Mr Speaker, in bringing the West together to, let, to make a united front against Vladimir Putin, particularly with the economic sanctions that we need, Mr Speaker. That is uh, the priority of the Government right now. Colin Meeks, what? Thank you, Mr Speaker. While the Prime Minister was eating birthday cake with his pals, people were standing outside nursing uh, home windows looking in at their loved ones dying. And contrary to what the Prime Minister has said, from that very dispatch box multiple times, any objective reading of Sue Gray's update makes it absolutely clear that the rules were broken multiple times in Downing Street. Will the Prime Minister continue a habit of a lifetime and keep blaming everybody else, or will he finally stand up, take responsibility and just go? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, he's really got to read the report, and he's got to, he's got to look at the report, and he's got to, he's got to wait. Mr. Speaker, all, everything he said, I'm afraid, is not substantiated by the report. Uh, he should look uh, and wait for the uh, for the police inquiry. Steve Baker. Thank you, Mr. 
Speaker, millions of people, millions of people, took seriously a communications campaign apparently designed by behavioural psychologists to bully, to shame and to terrify them into compliance with minute restrictions on their freedom. What is my right honourable friend's central message to those people who meticulously complied with all of the rules and suffered terribly for it, including, I might say, those people whose mental health will have suffered appallingly as a result of the messages his government was sending out? Mr Speaker, I, I, I want to thank all those people uh, for everything that they did, uh, because together uh, they have helped us to control uh, coronavirus, and I think thanks to their amazing actions in coming forward uh, to get vaccinated, we're now in a far better position than many other countries around the world. So I have a massive debt of gratitude to all the people that he describes. Then Diana Johnson. Question asked by my honourable friend, the member for Birmingham Yardley. I'm not asking for a running commentary, but I would like to know whether the Prime Minister was present in his flat at the event on the 13th of November 2020. I'm really grateful to him, Mr Speaker, and I understand why people want me to elaborate on all sorts of points, but I'm not going to make a running commentary on a matter that is now being uh, considered uh, by the authorities. I've got to wait for them to conclude. Andrew Jones. Speaker, the update that we have from Sue Gray today is, as she says herself, extremely limited and that it is not possible at present to provide a meaningful report. So will my right honourable friend confirm that at the earliest opportunity he will have the report published in full? Oh, Mr Speaker, what we will do is uh, wait until the police have concluded uh, their inquiries and then see what more uh, we can publish. That is what we are going to do. Catherine West. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. As the Prime Minister will recall, on the 8th of December in Prime Minister's Questions, I asked him, was there a party in Downing Street on the 13th of November? And now the report says, in the bullet point on the first page, that there was a gathering in the number 10 Downing Street flat, a gathering in the number 10 Downing Street on the departure of a special adviser. Did he inadvertently mislead this House, put us all out of our agony and stop dragging democracy through the mud. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I, I, she, I, I stick by what I said to her, and she should wait. Uh, if she cares about democracy and due process, she should wait until, until the inquiry has been concluded. Mark Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As a non-drinker, who long ago realised that sobriety delivers everything that alcohol promised. I have noticed with interest that a drinking culture exists in Downing Street and in fact predates my right honourable friend's tenure by some decades. Does he, like me, welcome Sue Gray's report and will he commit to fixing that culture? Yes, Mr Speaker, I thank you very much and uh, we're certainly, Mr Speaker, going to take up uh, the relevant parts of her recommendations and see that they are properly enforced within the, the civil service in the SPAD code. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The shocking incompetence of the Met Police has meant that we have a report that has been gutted. But frankly, we didn't need Sue Gray to tell us about the level of dishonour and deception that has infected not only Downing Street, but so many in the party opposite. It has been excruciating to watch so many Tory MPs and ministers willing to defend the indefensible, calculating what's in their own party political interests rather than what's right for our country, complicit in the same decaying system where the pursuit of power trumps integrity. The Prime Minister is certainly a bad apple, but the whole tree is rotten and the whole country wants reform. Couldn't we make a start with a major overhaul of the ministerial code, given that its founding assumption that it could be policed by a Prime Minister of the day because they would be a person of honesty and integrity, that founding assumption has been so widely and comprehensively and utterly discredited? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, of all the things that she just... We are, we are reforming the ministerial code, but of all the things that I disagree with her 
uh, about and what she's just said. I, I disagree with her most passionately in what she's just said about the police. I think they do an outstanding job. I think we should allow them to get on with that job, and I will await their conclusions. Thank you, Doyle Price. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. If I just uh, draw attention to uh, finding number seven uh, in this report, which documents that actually number 10 Downing Street has morphed from a small team in support of the Prime Minister to a self indulgent bureaucracy all its own. And I personally am tired of reading Sunday newspapers, which read of officials briefing against ministers, delays by things being stuck in number 10 as I speak to ministers who are getting frustrated. So, can I ask my right honourable friend that as he institutes this review, Call me old-fashioned, but ministers are accountable for decisions and that they're taken in their name, not flunkies in number 10. And will he ensure that reforms properly restore ministerial accountability? Yes. I, I, th I thank her very much, and uh, I very much enjoyed our joint trip to uh, Tilbury. Uh, this morning, and I can tell her that yes, I do think that it's vital, as Sue Gray says, that we learn from this and that we strengthen a cabinet government and the principle of ministerial uh, responsibility. Abzul Khan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have spoken about my own experience of loss during yes. the pandemic yes. many times. Yes. Yeah. I do not claim that my experiences are special. Indeed, they were all too common. But as a member of parliament, I have a responsibility to provide a voice for the bereaved families. Make no mistake, this report is utterly damning and suggests that the prime minister's and the government's actions were a risk to public health. How on earth can the prime minister stand there and justify this? Does he now accept that his actions were a complete and absolute failure of leadership and judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I thank him very much. And I repeat what I've said that I am deeply sorry for all the suffering that has been uh, throughout this pandemic, whether of his constituents or anyone uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, as to his, his points about uh, what is in the report, I don't think his views are substantiated by, the, uh, by what the report says, but I think he should wait to, he should wait to see uh, where the inquiry goes, and that's what I propose to do. Susan Webb. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right hon agree with me that those opposite have used up far too much time, far yeah. too much parliamentary yeah. time, yeah. debating this? And I can assure my right hon friends that the residents of Stourbridge, the residents of Stourbridge, they want the Prime Minister to focus on the matters that really they care about. Yeah. Just, just a moment. In fairness, the Prime Minister has to come and make the statement. No, I'm not going to attack the Prime Minister for making the statement. I certainly wouldn't expect it from his own side, Prime Minister. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think possibly what my, and I, but I want to say how strongly I agree with my, uh, nonetheless, with my, my, my honourable friend, because, uh, because uh, yes, of course, uh, it's, it's vital that we make this statement. Yes, of course, it's vital that we uh, learn from Sue Gray's report. And vital that we take action, uh, Mr. Speaker, which is what the government is doing. But it's also vital, frankly, that we get on with the people's priorities, and that is what this government is also doing. Christian Matheson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, just to summarise, we've had. I didn't know there was a party. Um, there was a party, but it was a work meeting, um, and um, uh, there was a party, but um, I wasn't there. Um, why is it? The Prime Minister mentioned um, international negotiations. Why should anybody, any country, any yeah, government exactly. with whom we enter into negotiations, yeah, exactly. deal um, at all and take take? Um, any kind of uh, word from a government that clearly acts with mendacity of foresaw, uh, forethought from start to beginning. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, uh, this is the government that took this country out of the EU uh, and did what was necessary, and this is the government uh, that is bringing uh, the West together to stand up against Vladimir Putin. Uh, and and those, are, those, are the, those are the important considerations. As for the rest of what he said, Mr Speaker, it's nonsense, but he should wait for the police inquiry. Holly yeah. Bobbycroft. Speaker, um, my constituents in Scunthorpe are very keen to see the industrial energy prices fixed. Will the Prime Minister reassure me that he will not be distracted by any of this and that he will get on with the job and come forward with a solution to that issue? Uh, yes, sir, I think my honourable friend is completely right. We, we not only need to address uh, consumer energy costs, we need to address, uh, address business and industrial energy costs as well. 
and I know that uh, my right honourable friend, uh, the Chancellor, uh, is, will be bringing forward a package of, of measures uh, as soon as he can. Kirsten Oswald. Mr Speaker, during his statement, the Prime Minister kept referring to we when he talks about the sorry saga that Sue Gray has reported. But Mr Speaker, it's his rules, it's his rule breaking, it's his inability to tell the truth about it that's the issue. He is the Prime Minister. Does he not take any personal responsibility at all for this disgraceful fiasco? Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, I've taken full responsibility throughout the pandemic. Richard Fuller. Speaker, as with the report on Owen Paterson, I felt it was important to support the process and read the report. And that's because I think it's important to separate fact from allegation and to know what the report actually says rather than what I would wish it to say. Yeah. Two lessons that the Leader of the Opposition needs to learn. Yeah. I promised my constituents that I would ask the Prime Minister to say that he would support the recommendations in the report. There are four. That every government department has a clear and robust policy in place covering the consumption of alcohol in the workplace. That access to the garden, including for meetings, should be invitation only and a controlled environment. That there should be easier ways for staff to raise such concerns, basically whistleblowing, and that too much responsibility and expectation is placed on the senior official whose principal function is the direct support of the Prime Minister. Those are the facts and the findings of the report. Will the Prime Minister accept them in full? Yes, uh, yes Mr Speaker, I, I do. And as I have said to the House earlier on, I accept the findings of the report uh, in full, uh, the general findings, and uh, we, we are immediately taking steps to implement the changes. Maria Riedel. The Prime Minister has just said he accepts the findings of the report. One of them says that there were failures of leadership and judgment by different parts of Number 10 in the Cabinet Office at different times. He provides the political leadership and the political judgment at Number 10. Does he accept his own personal wrongdoing and failings in this regard? Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr Speaker, not only have I accepted full responsibility uh, throughout, uh, but I, I have apologised uh, repeatedly to the House for any misjudgments that I may have made myself. Uh, but again, I, I must urge her to wait for the conclusion of the inquiry. Aaron Bell. It seems a lot of people attended events in May 2020. The one I recall attending was my grandmother's funeral. She was a wonderful woman, as well as a love for her family. She served her community as a councillor, and she served Dartford Conservative Association loyally for many years. I drove for three hours from Staffordshire to Kent. Only ten people at the funeral. Many people who loved her had to watch online. I didn't hug my siblings. I didn't hug my parents. I gave a eulogy. And then afterwards, I didn't even go to her house for a cup of tea. I drove back three hours from Kent to Staffordshire. Does the Prime Minister think I'm a fool? No, Mr Speaker. I, and I want to thank my honourable friend. And I want to, I, and I want to say how deeply I sympathise with him uh, and his family. Uh, for their loss. Uh, and all I can say is, uh, again, that uh, I'm very, very sorry for misjudgments that may be made in, uh, by me or anybody else in Number 10 uh, and the Cabinet Office. And I, I can only uh, ask him respectfully, uh, Mr Speaker, to look at what Sue Gray has said, but also to, look at the, to wait for the conclusion of the inquiry. I'm Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's important that this House can trust what ministers tell us from that dispatch box. And on the 8th of December, regarding events at number 10 Downing Street, the, minister, the Prime Minister said, I repeat that I have been repeatedly assured since these allegations emerged that there was no party and that no COVID rules were broken. That is what I have been repeatedly assured. Now, the people who gave him those assurances led to him inadvertently misleading the House. So, have those people faced any disciplinary proceedings? Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, first of all, he needs to, to I'm afraid, to, to await the conclusions of the police inquiry, uh, because uh, he, I'm afraid the, uh, he, the, the premise of his question may not, or may or may not, be uh, substantiated. But what I can tell the House is, yes, as I've said before, there certainly, there certainly uh, will be changes in the way we do things and changes in Number Ten. Duncan Baker. Speaker, North Norfolk consistently had some of the lowest levels of infection in the country. We followed the rules. 
So many of my constituents have been incensed. The damage that this is doing to the government is enormous. It is about integrity and trust. Can I ask again, because people want to know, how can the Prime Minister now satisfy my constituents and assure me that full accountability and transparency on the findings of the final Grey report will swiftly follow? Yeah. Well, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I will do whatever I can to ensure that this House has as much clarity as possible. There are legal issues uh, that, that we face, uh, Mr Speaker, about some of the, some of the testimony that has been, uh, that has been given. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, what I, th I think uh, Sue Gray wants uh, us to do is to wait for the conclusion of the, uh, of the investigation, of the inquiry, and to see where that goes, and, and to support the police in their work. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Does the Prime Minister need somebody else to tell him whether he was there or he is there now? Uh, I, I refer the honourable lady to the answer I've already given. Same Baines. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, we all recognise that Number 10 Downing Street is an unusual amalgam of workplace, office space, and private home. What steps will the Prime Minister take um, to ensure that the lines between each of them are made clearer in the future? Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's, uh, you will see that there are uh, uh, reference to that uh, very problem in Sue Gray's. Uh, report, and we are going to take steps, uh, Mr. Speaker, to uh, clarify things and to make sure uh, there, are, there is greater transparency in the lines of, of command. Stephen Timms. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Prime Minister recognise that repeatedly making statements, including from that dispatch box, which turn out subsequently to be untrue, is a serious problem, or does he not recognise that? <laughs> Uh, and Mrs. Mrs. Speaker, I really think he's prejudging things, and he should wait for the conclusion of the of the inquiries. Paul Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I welcome the fact that my right honourable friend has come to this house as a first step in responding to this report. He's also rightly outlined that the relationship between Number Ten and this house needs to improve. So, will he reassure me that he'll continue to come to this house to update us on the implementation of the recommendations in Sue Gray's report and how that will happen? Um, yeah, Mr. Speaker, I, I will, of course, I'm only too happy to uh, assure the House that we intend to uh, make changes starting from now, and uh, I will keep the House updated. Paul Barker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When there's a failure of leadership and an inappropriate culture in an organisation, the person at the top should go. This outrageous debacle hasn't happened in spite of the Prime Minister. This has happened because of the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister now do the right thing and resign? Uh, Mr Speaker, the answer is no, because I'm going to wait for the, uh, conclusions, of the, uh, the conclusions of the inquiry uh, before, before uh, all the, any of the assertions that she's made can be established. Frank Smith. Mr Speaker, I... Thank the Prime Minister for his statement, particularly the acknowledgement of the enormous sacrifice that so many British people went through. And as somebody who was unable to say goodbye to my grandparents this time <coughs> last year, can I welcome his sincere apology? But as we, as we wait, as we wait for the Metropolitan Police findings, can my right hon. friend give me a categoric assurance that it will be full speed ahead on fixing the Northern Ireland Protocol, standing up for our friends in Ukraine and fixing the cost of living crisis. Yes, uh, yes Mr Speaker, that is exactly what this Government is going to do, and nor will we be distracted for one minute. Yeah. Wayne David. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the, the general findings to secure, so, uh, Sue Gray's report, there is a reference to the failure of leadership and judgment by Number 10. Does the Prime Minister accept that Sue Gray was largely referring to him? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr Speaker, I really think that he should uh, recite the, the whole report, uh, but I have told him that I accept the findings, uh, I, I accept the findings uh, that Sue Gray has given in full, and we are acting on them today. 
Speaker, I, um, I welcome my right honourable friend's apology. He's taken responsibility, he's apologised, and it's right that he should do so. Can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, confirm that tackling the small boats crisis will remain top of the new office of the Prime Minister? Because that's what the country wants to see. We want to see this Prime Minister getting on with the job. Yes, that's right, Mr. Speaker, and that's why we brought forward the Nationalities and Borders Bill, which I'm delighted to say that she uh, supports that this government is getting through, which that party voted against. Stephen Farray. Thank you. The flippancy of some of the answers today and the non answers to other questions don't suggest that the Prime Minister is generally that sorry. Does he recognise the long term damage he risks doing to historic norms of democracy? Is it right that they are sacrificed for the interests of one man who refused to do what the country knows needs to happen? And can he point to one single example where he personally has improved standards in public life? <laughs> How about, Mr. Speaker, uh, deciding to uh, honour the wishes of the people? Brexit, in spite of their attempts, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, to subvert democracy. Yeah. Rob Roberts. Mr. Speaker, delivery is key. The Prime Minister delivers. He delivered on Brexit. He delivered with furlough and with the self employed scheme that ensured businesses were able to survive. They can shout it down because they don't like it, Mr. Speaker, that's fine. He delivered with one of the best vaccination programmes in the world. He delivered a country that is coming out of a pandemic and an economy that is thriving with people who sadly lost their jobs in the last two years having more vacancies than ever to choose from. But nobody talks about those things, Mr Speaker, because all sides of those things... I think the Prime Minister may have just got a grip of what you've had to say. Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, we're going to deliver on the people's priorities and we're going to deliver and keep delivering for Wales. Florence Session, love me. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, one of the hardest things I had to do as an MP is speak to the family of Ishmael Mohammed Abdullahi. He was 13 years old when he died on the 30th of March. He was one of the youngest people to lose his life to COVID. I will admit, Mr Speaker, when I spoke to his mother, I broke down on that call. Ishmael's family, like so many other constituents up and down in Vauxhall, followed the rule. Many of them were scared to go out. Many of them had to bury their loved ones without being there. Many of them walked past the COVID memorial wall in my constituency with that heart showing their loss. Does the Prime Minister now understand and does he not feel ashamed that his actions have brought disrepute to the office that he holds? Yeah. Madam, uh, Mr. Speaker, of course I uh, share the Honourable Lady's grief for, for Ishmael. Uh, I sympathise with uh, Ishmael's family, and I, I understand the pain and loss that everybody has experienced throughout this country. Uh, uh, but, uh, Mr. Speaker, all I can say is that uh, I will continue to do my best to fight COVID, as I have done uh, throughout this pandemic. And, and to deliver for the British people. And I can't say more than that. Mark Logan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, running an office and, the, and the, having the required management expertise of running literally dozens and dozens of offices with hundreds and hundreds of people within is one thing. Running the country and getting the big decisions right are quite another. So, can I welcome the Prime Minister's commitment? to have a, a look at what is happening at number 10 and those management structures so that we can deliver on the promises and yeah. the Brexit promises we gave the people of this country. Yeah. I, I thank him very much and that's why we're taking up the findings of the, uh, the Sue Gray report. We want to make sure that number 10 uh, works uh, better, that the whole of the government uh, works better, that it's been focused very much on, uh, on COVID, uh, but we now need to deliver exclusively on the, on the great priorities of the people. Anna Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Last summer, my team and I said goodbye to our colleague through the window of her hospice as she died of cancer. We didn't get to hug her, and we were just like many millions of people across the UK. We followed the rules, while he and his colleagues didn't. And it makes me sick to my stomach 
that we are not going to get the findings of this report because the police were so late to the party. The same Met Police who were happy to arrest women who were protesting the murder of Sarah Everard. And it makes me sick to my stomach that he does not understand the anger and fury and upset of millions of people across the UK. Because sometimes, Mr Speaker, an apology won't cut it. It's time for action. It's time for a clear out. It's time for him to resign. Mr Speaker, I, I, again, I, I sympathise very much with the experience of uh, her constituents uh, and, and all the pain that people have gone through throughout this pandemic. Uh, I must say to her, though, that she is prejudging uh, the issue, that the issue in, in question today. I don't think that's the right thing to do. Uh, I have uh, a great deal of respect for the police, and I think they should be allowed to get on with their job. Paul Hull. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I think we've got to remember that we're all talking about the breaking of the rules and the rules clearly are under question here as to what's happened. But the rules themselves that were put out by this government have got this country to where it is. And we've got to remember that those rules did the right thing. So yes, there's got to be consequences in number 10 for any rules that have been broken, but please remember the right thing was done by the instigation of the rules in the first place. And I have to say, when I'm talking to my constituents out there, they're saying, yes, we need to ask the question about what's happened there, but can we stop being that as the only sole subject? And do, can the opposition talk about something else as well, please? Do we need to move on and level up this country? I, I thank my honourable friend very much, and I think, I think he's right. The, the rules are important, and it was, very, it was, it was, it was amazing and it remains amazing uh, to see the way people pulled together throughout the, the pandemic. And I, I thank people very much. Uh, but what we need to do, if we possibly can, uh, Mr. Speaker, if, if, the, if the opposition would, uh, we, we, I think would, uh, would, would agree, uh, we now need to focus on the issues that matter above all to the British people: fixing the cost of living, rebuilding our economy, clearing the COVID backlogs. That's what this government is doing. Barry Sherman, Mr. Speaker, I have known the Prime Minister a long time, um, and we've always got on quite well. He's not a wicked man. But he's a man that for years, in every job, has got by flying on the seat of his pants. <laughs> he has a chaotic management style. And that is a question of character. And can I ask him, really, to look in the mirror, as he said this morning, and say, am I the man at this challenging time for our country, abroad, at home, in every sense, has he the character to carry on and do that job properly. No. No. Yes, Mr Speaker, because quite frankly, uh, I think it was absolutely indispensable that we had a strong number 10 uh, that was able to take us out of the EU in spite of all the efforts of the party opposite uh, to block it. And not only that, Mr Speaker, a, a booster and a vaccine campaign that were led by number 10 that have made a dramatic difference, not just to the health of this country, but to the economic fortunes of this country. And whatever he says about me and my leadership, that is what we have delivered in the last year alone. Scott Benson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. When knocking in doors in Blackpool at the weekend, I spoke to Julie, who said this. This Prime Minister has had the most difficult job in living history. He's been dealing with a pandemic in which he nearly died. He's been dealing with the media who haven't forgiven him for delivering Brexit. And yet, let's... He's been dealing with the media who haven't forgiven him yet for dealing with Brexit, and he hasn't had a chance to crack on and deliver yet for the British people on their priorities. The report today has come out. The Prime Minister has apologised. Let's allow him to get on and deal with oh, oh. oh, what he wants to hear. Sir. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I want to say how passionately, vehemently and emphatically I agree uh, with, the, with the remarks, which I couldn't quite hear, uh, of my, of my honourable friend. He is completely right, Mr Speaker, and I think that is the priority of the British people. That's the priority of the government. Brams. Limited as the Grey report uh, was, uh, we know that the, the, the findings are still incredibly damning. Um, multiple issues around uh, failures of leadership and judgment. Now, given that the Nolan principles and standards of public life describe the centrality of integrity, honesty, and leadership, how can the Prime Minister continue? 
I really think that she needs to read the report carefully, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and, 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 and I'm afraid that the conclusions that she's drawing are not ones that I support. But what we are doing, Mr. Speaker, is, is following Sue Gray's advice, and we are changing the way Number 10 runs, and we are going to, uh, to do things differently, Mr. Speaker. But I, I can't agree uh, with what she says. Catherine Fletcher. Mr. Speaker, on Saturday I was out and about enjoying ice cream in Lancashire, which I know you and your family do in some of the finest ice cream parlours in the north of England. And they said to me, he's a Wally, but 100,000 Russians have just turned up. Well, uh, what the bloody hell are we doing talking about cake? Does the Prime Minister agree with that statement? Uh, Mrs. Speaker, I, I, I thank her very much. Uh, I thank her very much, and I think that what the country, what the country needs, and what the West needs. Sorry. Can I just say, if you don't want to carry on the question, I'm happy to pull stumps now. But if we are going to have questions, I'm going to hear the answers as well as the questions. Prime Minister, stand up, mate. You're going to have to sit down for a bit. What the country needs now, Mr. Speaker, is a UK government uh, working with our friends and partners to stand up to Vladimir Putin and to make sure that we have a strong package of sanctions. And that's what we're doing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister sets the culture at number 10. Why does he think that staff members there felt unable to raise their concerns about the bad behaviours reported in today? Oh, uh, Mr. Speaker, that is one of the recommendations of the, uh, the Sue Gray inquiry that we are going to take up to make sure that nobody uh, should feel that uh, in number 10. And uh, that's why we're going to review the code uh, to ensure that nobody feels that they have uh, any inhibition on coming forward with any complaint uh, that they may have. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister and his allies are trying to distract and deflect from the truth. But here are the indisputable facts. The Prime Minister attended Downing Street parties. He told this House and the people that we represent that he attended no parties and, in fact, that there were no parties. The rules were clearly broken. The ministerial code has been violated. So when will he stop, stop in, insulting the intelligence of the British people and do the right thing and resign? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I really think she's got to let the Metropolitan Police get on and do their job. Brendan no, O'Hara. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister not recognise that the public are rapidly losing faith in the institutions that they must be able to trust if our democracy is to survive. Because it appears that there is no individual, no organisation, no group or no force whose reputation won't be sacrificed on the altar of saving this Prime Minister. So can I ask the Prime Minister, does he consider the erosion of public trust in the foundations of our democracy a price worth paying to ensure his personal survival. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I believe that the foundations of, amongst the foundations of our democracy uh, are due process in the rule of law and allowing the police to get on with their job, and that's what we're going to do. Luke Pollard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Part four of Sue Gray's report says that there is an ex a culture of excessive consumption of alcohol, which is not appropriate. Is there also a culture of excessive drug taking in Downing Street? Right. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, any drug taking would be excessive, and perhaps he should direct that question at the Labour front bench. Direct to Egg. What? what? Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've heard all about prejudging things today. We only have to look at paragraph three of the general findings, which talks about failures of leadership, judgment in different parts of Number 10 yeah. at the Cabinet Office. And it says some events should never have been allowed to take place, and other events should not have been allowed to develop as it did. I think that's prejudging anything, it's very clear. It's only one person in charge of Number 10 in, in totality, and that's the Prime Minister. So let me just remind the Prime Minister why this matters about this rule breaking and the way Number 10 behaved. Let me quote a constituent, one of a number of emails I had from constituents who lost loved ones. She said to me, We received a call at 11.15 pm on the 29th of May 2020 saying Mum was deteriorating. Both my sister and I drove to the home and spent the night sat on a chair outside her bedroom window watching her die. All I could do was sob and shout to her and tell her that I loved her. 
I couldn't even hold a hand. That's why you should go, Prime Minister. Yeah, 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 yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I totally understand uh, the feelings of his, uh, his constituents, and uh, I accept that uh, things could have been done better in, uh, in Number 10, as I've told the House before. But uh, really, I, I must ask him to uh, study what uh, Sue Gray has said, uh, and, 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 and we are acting on all her recommendations. Nadine Whitton. Which one of them, Mr. Speaker? Oh, now he's over there. <laughs> She's there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can the Prime Minister explain how changing the civil service hierarchy will prevent him from breaching the COVID regulations, as he has admitted in this House? When will he take responsibility for his own actions, stop hiding behind other people? My constituents don't want another government department. They want him to resign. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, she's wrong in what she said, and I direct her to what I uh, said earlier on. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It's been further revealed that in April 2021, as the Prime Minister partied, he also swiftly rejected the idea of bereavement bubbles for those who would lost loved ones, <laughs> suffered miscarriages, stillbirths or a child neonatal death. Far from getting it, he's deflected, laughed and smirked his way through this statement. He's a disingenuous man, isn't he? Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, no, uh, this has been uh, a harrowing and tragic experience for the entire country. Uh, we've done our best to, uh, to deal with it. And uh, I, as for what she says about what's been going on in Number 10, uh, I, I ask her to look at the report, but also to wait for the, uh, the police inquiry. Owen Thompson. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, this afternoon we've heard the distraction, the deflection, there's confusion, and we can't even get the answers to the most simplest of questions about whether we can actually get the full report published when it's available. So, Mr Speaker, could I ask the Prime Minister, is it the case now that we're looking at a situation of hobble, hobble, quack, quack. Minister. Mr Speaker, I, 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 nothing would uh, give me greater pleasure than to publish everything that uh, we currently have. But the fact is, Mr Speaker, that we are legal impediments and we have to wait until uh, the police inquiry is concluded. Sir William Cash. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I, I accept entirely what the Prime Minister has just said. It is absolutely essential that we wait... It's absolutely essential that we wait until we hear the next stage in this, these proceedings in relation to any future investigations. I'd also like to draw attention to the historic achievements of this Prime Minister in relation, in relation to not only delivering Brexit, but in relation to delivering the vaccine rollout and in relation to his dealings with Mr Putin. And I believe that everybody should take that most firmly into account. Yeah. Uh, I, I thank you very much, I, and I think he's completely right. Uh, and uh, he might have added, by the way, that we have the fastest economic growth in the G7, uh, Mr Speaker, thanks to the steps this government uh, has been taking. Terence. Mr. Speaker, we've established that there were parties. We are just really arguing about who is responsible. And as the Honourable Member for Thurrock said earlier, that's a minister. So if it's not him, is it the member for Surrey, Heath or North East Cambridgeshire who should be facing the sack? Uh, Prime Minister. Uh, I remind the Honourable Lady what Sue Gray says in her uh, paragraph. Well, no such conclusion can be drawn uh, so far, Mr. Speaker. She, she must wait. Uh, she must wait for uh, the conclusion of the inquiry. Janet David. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister announced at the weekend that he would be calling President Putin to urge de-escalation of the situation in Ukraine. Yeah. The Mirror have just reported uh, that today the call has been cancelled because he's been dealing with the Sue Gray report. So, can the Prime Minister confirm? that on a matter of such grave importance that this report is correct and that we will be speaking to Vladimir Putin as soon as he leaves the chamber. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I will be speaking to President Putin as soon as I can. Leila <laughs> Brown. Thank you, Mr Speaker. There, I have read the report in full and I think the most striking sentence 
was the one that there were failures of leadership and judgment in different parts of Number 10 and the Cabinet Office at different times. My constituents have been writing to me whilst the Prime Minister has been speaking, say that he should resign, but they also want to know the full facts. Once the Met has concluded, why could he not then publish the full unredacted report? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have to see uh, where the police get to. We have to see the conclusion of their inquiry. We have to see what the legal position is then, Mr. Speaker. Mohammed Jassin. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My constituents are deeply troubled and angry by the frequent scandals engulfing the Prime Minister's administration. Because it's not just the party gate and ongoing cover up, but, but all the other things the proroguing of Parliament the treatment of the Queen, the $3.5 billion of chronic COVID contracts, the writing of $4.3 billion COVID loan fraud, and the Russia report, to name but a few. Sussex University researchers have warned that Boris Johnson's administration is more corrupt than any other administration since the Second World War. Does the Prime Minister know this, doesn't he? Prime Minister didn't. Well, I, I think the honourable gentleman's point is completely ridiculous. He mentions, uh, he mentions what we did, uh, for instance, to get Brexit done, which was absolutely crucial to restore public trust in democracy. Richard Holden. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Like me, many of my constituents have been appalled by the reports of what's been happening in Number 10 and will welcome the fact that my right honourable friend has come to the House today and has apologised in a first step to responding to this. Will he assure me that he will continue to keep the House updated on the implementation of the measures he's taking in the report? And also, will he ensure that there's full cooperation from the whole of the Number 10 team uh, to the inquiries from the Met so they conclude as swiftly as possible? Prime Minister. Uh, Yes, Mr Speaker, of course I will keep the House updated and, of course, uh, everybody in, num in Number 10 will cooperate uh, to the full uh, with the Met. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This is surely now a new low. A Prime Minister of our country forced to come here to the Mother of Parliaments and plead the fifth in a criminal investigation because he knows if the truth is told, it will incriminate himself. So let me just ask the Prime Minister a simple question. If he cannot get his facts straight about whether or not he was at a party in his own flat, how will anyone in this House ever believe a word he says again, and how will our partners around the world ever put their trust in him? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm not going to uh, dignify that question with an answer, except to say, uh, except to say that he's got to wait. Everything he said is completely prejudicial. Yeah. Alan Brown. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thought people of Lancashire were supposed to be straight speaking because I, I can assure, assure people that my constituents are calling the Prime Minister a lot more than a wally, words I can't repeat. The reality is here we've got staff were too frightened to raise concerns about behaviour they, they knew were ongoing. Half the staff invited to bring your own booze party didn't turn up because they knew it was wrong, but yet the Prime Minister said he thought it was a work event and within the rules. His lack of leadership and judgment is also shown by the late the body's Powell High comment about a second lockdown. The one thing the leader of the yeah. Scottish Tories has said that is true is this Prime Minister is not fit for office. Now, given he'll do anything to save his own skin, does that mean the leader of the Scottish Tories is going to get binned as well? Yeah. <laughs> Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I direct him to what I've said earlier on. Mick Whitley. I think yeah, no, no one said in this House here this afternoon, uh, 155,000 people died of COVID. That's why we introduced the rules. But this is simply not the comprehensive report that the British public were promised for so long. But at least it's clear in its findings that there were serious failures. And I quote, to observe not just the high standards expected of those working at the House of Government, but also the standards expected of the entire British population at the height of the pandemic. Does the Prime Minister accept responsibility for his failure to live up to the standards which the rest of us would expect to uphold? Mr Speaker, I take responsibility for everything uh, that happened in Number 10 and that the Government did throughout the pandemic. Harry Gardner. The great report is clear that there should be no excessive consumption of alcohol in a workplace. Can the Prime Minister therefore assure the House 
that his own consumption of alcohol was not excessive, and in particular that his judgment was at no time so clouded that he was in danger of telling the truth. Prime Minister. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, I, I couldn't quite hear the end of the uh, right honourable gentleman's question, uh, but the answer is no. If he thinks I've was, I, I, I drunk too much, no. Alex Norris. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister wants my constituents to suspend their disbelief and wait for the Met Police to report. In which case, will he at least give them clarity that should the Metropolitan Police issue him with a fixed penalty notice for participation at his party, he will resign? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, he really needs to wait and see what the, what the Met uh, decide. Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. We've had excessive whataboutery, bluster and bravado from the Prime Minister. I suggest to him politely that we need a lot more humility from him, given that whilst the Grey report might be paper thin, it's very clear in the serious failings at number 10. Fish rots from its head. Can I suggest to the Prime Minister it's not a new Prime Minister's office we need, it's a new Prime Minister? Well, I, I, I hear him and I simply repeat what I've said earlier on. Uh, I'm grateful to Sue Gray for taking action uh, following her report, but he needs to wait for the conclusion of the inquiry. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Sue Gray has made it clear that this is not a report, but it's an update on the investigation into COVID breaches in Downing Street. Indeed, her, in her update, Ms Gray says she is extremely limited in what she can say and, yep. quote, it is not possible at present to provide a meaningful report. If it is the case that there's nothing to see here, move on, as the Prime Minister today is desperately trying to convince us, why has he repeatedly refused to commit to publish the full report even after the police investigation has completed? Yep. And what does it say about the benches opposite, those populating them, if they still them? genuinely think that he is the best amongst them to be uh. Prime Minister? <laughs> That's not what I've said. Neil Coyle. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister told Parliament and told the British people that there were no parties. We now know he attended several, including one at which he was ambushed with cake in his most pathetic excuse yet. Given his previous statements, which we know to be patently false, how does he explain why this report says at least 12 parties in his home warrant police investigation? Prime Mr Speaker, he's proved several times in that question that he hasn't got the faintest idea what he's talking about and he should wait for the outcome of the inquiry. Rupa Hart. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister and his apologists up to now had explained these things away as one-offs, you know, a work do, uh, ambushed by a cake, all those kind of things. But this report makes clear that it was a repeated pattern of behaviour, yeah. the booze-ups after work that nobody else was having, all our constituents who followed the rules. So can I ask him as well, it also says that there was there's an investigation of a Downing Street party on the 13th of November 2020. Why did he tell my honourable friend for Hornsey and Wood Green on the 8th of December that no such gathering took place? And subsequently he's told my right honourable friend, our leader, that anyone who from that dispatch box tells Mr Truths should resign. Is he a man of his words? Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, she needs to, to look at what I said, and she needs to look at the outcome. She needs to look at the outcome of the inquiry. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the Prime Minister said in a statement earlier that he understands the anger of people in this country, but does he also understand that while they've been watching this, for many people in this country, their greatest fears about how this would be handled have been realised. They've seen an apology, yes, but obfuscation, delay, tinkering, rather than an acceptance of a responsibility. Mm -hmm. The Prime Minister says he wants to go on and deal with the important issues facing this country. Perhaps the only way we will be able to do that is for the Prime Minister to accept that he has become an obstacle to it and resign. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Uh, uh, no, Mr Speaker, we're going to get on with the job. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff Smith. 
Thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister was wrong in something he said earlier. The Sue Gray update can be both damning and incomplete. And most of us can only guess how much more damning the full report is going to be. And his colleagues should worry about that. But I think he knows how bad it's going to be because he knows what's gone on. So isn't that the real reason why he won't commit to publishing the report in full when the police have completed their investigation? Prime Minister. No, Mr Speaker, he's totally prejudging the whole thing. He needs to contain himself. No, he needs to contain himself and wait for the police to complete their inquiries. Yeah. Drew Hendry. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Sue Gray update is not the report that this House deserves. It is not the transparency that the public were expecting. Yeah. But it does make it very clear that were, there were failures of leadership at number 10. The Prime Minister is the leader at number 10. Yeah. So will he now pack his suitcase or will he leave it to his officials to carry his cans? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, he, he just needs to, to look at the uh, report again and he needs to wait for the conclusions of the inquiry. Matt Weston. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Look her in the eyes and tell her you never bend the rules. A lot of us remember that campaign. It cost tens of millions of taxpayers' money. On the 13th of November in 2020, he bent the rules, didn't he? Uh, Mr Speaker, I refer him to what I've said earlier on in this House. And uh, frankly, Mr. Speaker, he needs to wait until the conclusion of the police inquiry. Stephen Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This morning, the Conservative Party in Scotland issued a press release, and it stated, and I quote, "The pandemic sees rise in criminals getting away with crimes." <laughs> Were they talking about the Prime Minister? <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, what we're actually doing is cutting crime. Uh, by 40 per cent, putting uh, 20,000 more, 20, more police on the streets. Roshanara Ali. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Week in, week out, throughout this pandemic, I, like many of my colleagues, had to deal with constituents who couldn't see their dying relatives or grieve with them. And some of us were directly affected when we lost family members and loved ones. The Prime Minister's actions have made a mockery of the British people's sacrifices during the pandemic. And now he's the subject of a criminal investigation. It's a new low for our country and our democracy, and it makes a mockery of our democracy to the rest of the world. If the Prime Minister takes responsibility for everything that, he's, that has happened, as he has said, isn't it time that he put his party, this parliament, and the country out of their misery and steps down so that we can move on and focus on the national interest because at the moment it is not possible because of the crisis that he and number 10 have created. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Prime uh, no, Mr Deputy Speaker. Carol Monaghan. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's clear that the Prime Minister has used these parties, like many an under par manager, to buy popularity and favour. Yeah. Yeah. Can the Prime Minister tell us if he's using the same techniques when negotiating treaties and trade deals with international leaders? Uh, Prime Minister. Uh, uh, no, Mr Deputy Speaker. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Today should have been about contrition and remorse, but it seems that the Prime Minister doesn't understand the meaning of sorry. Instead, it has insulted the people that have suffered and sacrificed for the last two years. One question that many people want to know is who is paying for these investigations, the police and uh, Sue Gray's report, and who is paying for his legal advice? Is it the taxpayer? Prime Minister. Uh, I, I must say, I think that... Uh, uh, she's wrong in what she says. Uh, as, as for who is, co who is covering the police costs, uh, the police are covering uh, the police costs. Daisy Cooper. Peter. 
Ray report, when he had read as far as the front cover, he would see it was called an update. Yep. It is because it is an update that it makes public trust in the Met's investigation even more important. The public must know that the Met will investigate without fear or favour. So can the Prime Minister confirm okay. that not at any single stage anybody in Number 10 or the Cabinet Office has sought to influence the Met's decision on delaying its initial investigation, or was the delay a result of its own incompetence? Uh, no, Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, the only people calling into question the, uh, the Met's independence uh, are, I think, the, 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 the side opposite on, on her benches. Thank you. The Prime Minister has seriously misjudged the mood of the country, and indeed he has misjudged the mood of his own backbenchers. My constituent wrote to me devastated and upset. He couldn't see his disabled son, his elderly mother with dementia, and his newborn child putting a serious toll on his mental health. Like millions across the country, he followed the rules, but the Prime Minister thinks he's above the rules. Instead, he blames his civil service and he restructures. Will he do the decent thing and resign? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I disagree with her profoundly because I, I, I do understand uh, people's feelings and I do understand why uh, this is so important for people. Yeah. But uh, I, I must say that I think the best thing now is for the uh, inquiry to be concluded and in the meantime for us all to get on with the work that I think everybody wants us to do. Marion Fellows. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I have enjoyed the exercise this afternoon. <laughs> I've also like, wanted to enjoy the Prime Minister's answers to questions, but unfortunately he's ducked, dived, he's done everything yep. but answer questions yep. about a party on the 13th yep. of November, about whether he'll put out the final report. OK, I'll ask him one more. I asked already. If you get a fine, a fixed penalty fine, from the Metropolitan Police after all this is over. Will you pay it yourself or ask a Tory donor to pay it for you? Uh, Mr Speaker, there's a process. We've got to wait for it to conclude. Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Among those who were the most isolated during the pandemic were people with learning disabilities, cut off from visits from their families, not even allowed an advocate if they were admitted to hospital. For too many, restrictions to services and the awful isolation without visitors that the PM's rules expected them to follow were a matter of life and death. The mortality rate for people with learning disabilities from COVID was eight times that of the general population. When he thinks about the damage done to all those groups who are so isolated and their families, and the serious failings of leadership and judgment in number 10 found by this independent investigation, how can he think his position is tenable? Okay. Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, she's entirely right about the the suffering of people with learning disabilities and indeed all vulnerable groups who are exposed to, uh, to, to lockdowns for, for long periods. And that's why actually uh, we worked so hard uh, to make sure that we could get this country out of lockdown and keep it out of lockdown. And that was our objective. Stuart Housie. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I don't need to wait for the full Sue Gray report because this one tells me one important fact. There were a heck of a lot of parties. So can I ask the, there were a heck of a lot of parties, Prime Minister. So let me ask the Prime Minister, at which point during this catalogue of frivolity, while he was clearing last night's empty wine bottles off his desk before settling down to work the following afternoon, <laughs> did he conclude that having one rule for him and another one for the general public was undermining his own health messaging and costing people's lives. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr. Speaker, I mean, Mr. Deputy Speaker, he, uh, the, the honourable gentleman is uh, misrepresenting uh, what Sue Gray says. He's also, uh, perhaps inadvertently, uh, but he's also completely misrepresenting uh, what happened. Kim Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. This report confirms what we already know, the abject failure in leadership at number 10. So will the Prime Minister take responsibility and do what the constituents in Liverpool and Riverside are asking for, your resignation, so that we can get on and deal with the crisis facing this country? Thank you. Uh, uh, no, Mr Deputy Speaker, I refer to what I have said earlier on. 
Justin Matters. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On the 8th of December, the Prime Minister told this House, and I quote, I have been repeatedly assured since these allegations emerged that there was no party and that no COVID rules were broken. Well, just who gave him those assurances? Because given he was at some of the parties and at least one of them was his, in his own flat, he shouldn't need anyone else to tell him what happened. So it looks like when the Prime Minister spoke those words, he was either fooling himself or was he just trying to fool everyone else? Prime yeah. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, he needs to wait and see. He needs to wait and see uh, what the inquiry concludes, and, he, and that is what due process demands. And I stick, Mr. Speaker, by what I say. I can see eight people standing, and that is the last date I'm going to take. Just to let you know, Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Section 5.1 of the Ministerial Code says ministers must uphold the political impartiality of the civil service and not ask civil servants to act in any way which would conflict with the civil service code. And finding six of Sue Gray's report, which I have read, says some staff wanted to raise concerns about behaviours they witnessed at work, but, uh, but felt unable to do so. So does the Prime Minister agree with me that if his staff, and in fact civil servants and workers everywhere, feel afraid to raise concerns regarding inappropriate behaviour at work, that they should contact their trade union rep or join a trade union? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, that's why I've accepted the conclusions of the uh, Sue Gray findings in full, and uh, we will implement the changes. And I assume that everybody standing has also been here for the opening statement and throughout. Caroline Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I've listened carefully to the statement, the questions, the answers, and indeed to my constituents, many of whom have been devastated to hear that there may have been parties, and some of whom have suffered great hardship. I'm very glad that the Prime Minister has come here to apologise and to take on board the recommendations, but I am concerned that this is taking time and attention away from key issues. This statement alone has been going on for nearly two hours. The Prime Minister has achieved great things with Brexit and vaccines, but has achieved great things with Brexit and vaccines. Can he assure this House and me and my constituents that this ongoing investigation and the reorganisation of Number 10 is not going to take his laser-like focus away from the issues that matter to them? Yeah. Uh, sir, yes, I can uh, give my honourable friend that uh, absolute assurance. Hilary Benn. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker. Has a date yet been set for the Prime Minister to be interviewed by the Metropolitan Police in connection with their inquiry? <laughs> Prime Minister, uh, the, the police are independent and they must get on with their inquiry. Ed Dugan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. This reads like a dreadful, poorly written soap opera, an unbelievable soap opera. I hear members opposite saying how important it is for their constituents to get on with the day job. My constituents are incandescent at the behaviour of this Prime Minister. Will he accept the damage he's doing to the office of elected representatives, all of us, and will he do the right thing and clear out? Yeah. Prime Minister. No, Mr Deputy Speaker, for the reasons I've already given. Steve Bonner. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, we do know that staff are being made to work in conditions that made them feel uneasy, perhaps even unsafe, Prime Minister. And they also felt that they were unable to say something. People exposed to a potentially deadly virus, unable to say something in their workplace, while parties were raging on around about them. At least some, says Mrs Gray, represent a serious failure to observe the high standards expected of those working at the heart of government. Who is responsible for that, Prime Minister? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, he's completely represent misrepresenting uh, what took place. Gavin Newlands. <laughs> Come on. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Despite the omissions from Sue Gray's update, it makes crystal clear that the office he occupies and the government he leads behaved in a despicable and disrespectful way when the public faced the yeah, gravest yeah. of threats. Does he not accept that his personal conduct before becoming Prime Minister and since is completely unacceptable and if he had any respect for his own office, the public, and did even a scintilla of integrity, he would announce his resignation to the 1922 Committee tonight? Yeah. 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 Uh, no, Mr Deputy Speaker. Stuart MacDonald. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I ask, when will the various statements made by the Prime Minister from that dispatch box about the subject 
of parties and gatherings at Downing Street be investigated under the ministerial code? And isn't it absolutely farcical that that's a question for the Prime Minister at all? Yeah, yeah. 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 All right, sir. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we have a we have an investigation going on. Uh, I think it's very. I think that that's the one uh, people should focus on, and they should allow the police to get on with their job. Richard Thompson. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In his statement, the Prime Minister said, "Sorry for the things we did not get right. Sorry for the way this has been handled. A generic non-apology." that will mean absolutely nothing to anyone that's heard it. But what I and millions of others want to hear is, apart from getting caught out in all of this, what is it that the Prime Minister is personally sorry for and genuinely regretful for in terms of his own conduct? And if he just resorts back to that tired, hackneyed form of words that he used to begin with, doesn't it just show that it's not a new office of the Prime Minister that we need? It's a new Prime Minister in office. Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I've re re repeated several times uh, how sorry I am for any misjudgments that, that I made, uh, and I continue to apologise uh, for them. Uh, and uh, all I can say, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is that we need to get on and, uh, and await the outcome of the inquiry, but it, allow the government uh, and, uh, to deliver on the priorities of this uh, country, and that is uh, to unite and level up, uh, to continue to cut crime. Uh, to make colossal investments across our whole country, and that is what we are going to do. I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for his statement today and asking questions for just short of two hours. I'm just going to pause as uh, people leave and others take their places for the next statement. Thank you, Simon. Very good on me. Order. We now come to the second of the three statements today, and we have the Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Affairs, Liz Truss. Mr Deputy Speaker, with permission, I would like to make a statement on what we are doing to tackle Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Moscow's malign intent is clear. They have massed over 100,000 troops on Ukraine's frontier. Russian forces are continuing to arrive in Belarus. It is only eight years since Russia illegally annexed Crimea and stoked conflict in the Donbass region, so we know the danger is real. They have been pursuing a campaign of hybrid warfare aimed at destabilising the country. Just last week, we exposed the Kremlin's plans to install a puppet regime in Kiev. This threatening behaviour towards a sovereign, democratic, independent country is completely unacceptable. It is a clear violation of the commitments and obligations that Russia freely signed up to, from the OSCE Helsinki Final Act and the Minsk Protocols to the Budapest Memorandum, which guaranteed to respect the independence and sovereignty and the existing borders of Ukraine. The only way forward is for Russia to de-escalate, pull back its troops, and engaging meaningful talks on the basis of these existing obligations. That is why the UK is determined to lead the way through deterrence and diplomacy. The Prime Minister will travel to the region this week, and later today the UK will be joining discussions at the UN Security Council to apply further pressure on Russia to take the diplomatic route. I will be flying out to Moscow over the next fortnight. This builds on our campaign of diplomatic engagement over recent weeks and months. I have led calls through the G7, NATO and the OSCE to urge Russia to desist in its reckless and destabilising activities in Ukraine as well as Georgia, the Baltics and the Western Balkans. I have raised these issues directly with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Both the United States and NATO have set out areas where we could explore reciprocal measures to increase transparency, reduce risk and take forward arms control. The ball is firmly in Russia's court. While we are determined to accelerate these efforts, we do so from a position of strength. We are combining dialogue with deterrence, and that is why the Prime Minister is considering options for further deployments of our armed forces to reassure and protect allies on NATO's eastern flank. We are preparing to offer to support NATO with additional fast jets, warships, 
and military specialists. As NATO's biggest spender in Europe on defence, we are prepared to deploy our forces accordingly. We have been very clear that a united alliance would meet any further Russian invasion of Ukraine with massive consequences for Russia's interests and economy, and we are preparing an unprecedented package of coordinated sanctions with our partners, which would impose severe costs. Today, I am setting out our readiness to act. We will be laying legislation before the House that will significantly strengthen our hand in dealing with Russia's aggressive action towards Ukraine. It will go further than ever before. Until now, the UK has only been able to sanction those linked to destabilisation of Ukraine. This new legislation will give us the power to sanction a much broader range of individuals and businesses. We will be able to target any company that is linked to the Russian state, engages in business of economic significance to the Russian state, or operates in a sector of strategic significance to the Russian state. Not only will we be able to target these entities, we will also be able to go after those who own or control them. This will be the toughest sanction regime against Russia we have ever had, and it is the most radical departure in approach since leaving the European Union. Those in and around the Kremlin will have nowhere to hide. We will make sure that those who share responsibility for the Kremlin's aggressive and destabilising action will share in bearing a heavy cost. Their assets in the UK will be frozen. No UK business or individual would be able to transact with them, and should they seek to the, enter the UK, they would be turned back. Laying this legislation now will enable us to act in concert with the United States and other partners rapidly, multiplying our collective impact. We will use these new powers in a targeted manner designed to damage the interests of those who bear the greatest responsibility for Russia's actions and exert the greatest pressure to change course. I will not say now exactly who we may target or with what measure, but Moscow should be clear that we will use these new powers to maximum effect if they pursue their aggressive intent towards Ukraine. Nothing is off the table. We are also standing with our Ukrainian friends by providing vital support to help them defend themselves. That's where we're supplying the country with defensive anti-tank missiles and deploying a training team of British personnel. We've already trained over 21,000 me members of the Ukrainian army through Operation Orbital. And in addition, we're stepping up our investment in Ukraine's future, ramping up support for trade up to 3.5 billion, including 1.7 billion to boost Ukraine's naval capability. We will continue to stand united with Ukraine. Mr Deputy Speaker, it might seem hard to believe that in the 21st century, the citizens of a proud, sovereign European democracy are living under the threat of invasion. We know from the lessons of history that this course of action would benefit no one. I do not believe that ordinary Russian citizens want to enter into an intractable quagmire of needless death and destruction that could rival the Soviet-Afghan war or the conflict in Chechnya. Indeed, we have no quarrel whatsoever with the Russian people, only with the policies pursued by its leader. It is time for the Kremlin to step back from the brink, to de-escalate and enter into meaningful dialogue. If they do not, they should be in no doubt. We will be ready to use the powers I have set out today to maximum effect. We will join our allies and partners to ensure such reckless action will bring huge consequences at massive cost. We will defend freedom, democracy and the rule of law. I, condemn, I commend this statement to the House. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Right Honourable Lady for advance sight of her statement and for our discussions on this issue. I am very grateful. Mr Deputy Speaker, as we in the Opposition have been clear since this crisis began, we stand in resolute support of Ukraine's sovereignty and in opposition to Russian aggression. We support the essential international diplomatic efforts to achieve de-escalation and the defensive support provided to Ukraine. I said in Kiev two weeks ago, and I say it again now, 
on these benches, we believe it is important to send a united message from the whole of the House. That is why we welcome moves by the Government to lay the groundwork for a robust and extensive package of sanctions against Russia in the event of any incursion or attack on Ukraine. We believe these measures must be broad, severe and comprehensive. They must apply widely to crucial sectors of the Russian economy without gaps or loopholes. They must target corrupt elites who store their money in our country. They must target not just relevant Russian entities, but those who enable, who support, who service, who facilitate their activities. So can the Foreign Secretary confirm that UK subsidiaries of any new sanction targets would, be would not be carved out of scope? Yeah. We know that some oligarchs have used their wealth to seek influence and protect themselves from criticism. So can I ask for her assurance that these measures will be applied without fear or favour? Given these measures were pre-briefed and include broad categories of potential targets, can I ask her what assessment she has made of the risks of asset flight and what steps she's taken to protect against that? Mr Deputy Speaker, these sanctions are conditional on Russian actions. Their purpose is to form a serious deterrent, which, when matched by unified action and the work of the G7, NATO and the OSCE will make President Putin think again. But there is much more we must do irrespective of the decisions made by President Putin. Things that it should not have taken an army threatening Ukraine to put in place. Things the opposition have repeatedly urged the government to address. For years, the Labour Party and colleagues from across this House have raised the alarm about the role of dirty money in keeping Putin in power. Mr Deputy Speaker, for too long our defences have been let down at home while the government looks abroad. Warning after warning, report after report, the government has been asleep at the wheel. London is the destination of choice for the world's kleptocrats. We are the home to the services and the enablers who help corrupt elites to hide their ill-gotten wealth. We have a system of corporate transparency that permits the products of larceny on a grand scale to be hidden under our noses. And the result is the embarrassing spectacle of President Biden being warned that the widespread presence of suspect Russian money in the UK could jeopardise Britain's response to this crisis. This is not a matter simply of individuals, though welcome though that is. It's about fixing a broken system, our openness to fraud and money laundering, our inadequate regulation of political donations, our lax mechanisms of corporate governments, our weakness to foreign interference. So can I ask the Right Honourable Lady, where is the economic crime bill the government just pulled? Where is the comprehensive reform of Companies House? Where is the register? of Overseas Entitlements Bill? Yep. Where is the Foreign Agent Registration Law? Yep. Where are the new counter-espionage laws? Yep. Where are new rules on political donations? Where is the reform of Tier 1 Golden Visas? Yep. Where is the replacement of the outdated Computer Misuse Act? Yep. Where is the reform of the Electoral Commission? And why does the Government's Election Bill make these per problems worse? by enabling political donations from donors based overseas. Yeah. 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 Mr Deputy Speaker, the Right Honourable Lady's movement on sanctions is welcome, but there is much, much more to do. Yeah. Yeah. These steps at home are not distinct from sanctions or diplomacy abroad. They must pop form part of a unified and coherent response, yeah. one that has been urged consistently by the Chair of the Intelligence Select Committee. Mm -hmm. If she truly wants to fix the problem, she must start there. Yeah. Yeah. Secretary. Well, first of all, can I thank the Shadow Foreign Secretary for his constructive approach. And I think it's vital that all uh, members of the House demonstrate their support for freedom and democracy 
in the face of severe aggression by the Russian regime, not just on the borders of Ukraine, but also through Belarus, uh, into the Western Balkans, and in fact, across the world. And I will take forward the united message that I have heard from the whole House onto uh, our friends in Ukraine, who very much welcome uh, the support that they have been offered by the United Kingdom, both the economic support, uh, the support in terms of defensive weaponry, but also the support in the face of Russian aggression. Uh, this package uh, that we are putting forward in legislation will be in place by the 10th of February, so we are, are able to enact wide-ranging sanctions in broad categories that really target anybody that is providing strategic or economic support to the Russian regime. There will be nowhere to hide, and we will apply those sanctions without fear or favour. I am very clear about that. Mr Deputy Speaker, we have already taken steps to tighten up our regime on corruption and, existing, uh, uh, and illicit finance through the Criminal Finances Act 2017, uh, the global anti-corruption sanctions regime we have put in place. We are reviewing all Tier 1 visas uh, granted before the 5th of April. And we will be introducing the Economic Crime Bill. The Prime Minister committed to that at the Summit of Democracies with President Biden at the end of last year. Let me assure the House that our priority is the defence of freedom and democracy. That comes before any short-term economic interest for our country, but also the whole of Europe. We must wean ourselves and others off dependence on Russian gas. We must target uh, the criminal and corrupt money, and that is what we are determined to do with this extension of our sanctions regime, the most radical we have done yet. Tom Tugendhat. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It is a pleasure to hear from my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, about the tightening of this sanction regime, something that she knows that the Foreign Affairs Committee has called for yep. for four years. Yep. It is extremely welcome that she is looking hard at dirty money, and I hear I find myself in agreement with my right honourable friend, the member for Tottenham. The need to clean up the dirty money in our economy is not just about doing the right thing and standing up alongside the people of Ukraine. It is about standing up for the British people, defending ourselves against the corruption that flows through our system, making sure that our houses, our homes are not being exploited to pay murderers on behalf of a dictator. This is not a foreign problem. This is a problem for the United Kingdom to deal with at home. And the strongest thing we can do to defend Ukraine is to defend ourselves against filth and corruption in our city. Well, my, my, uh, my honourable friend is right in the work that the Foreign Affairs Select Committee has done to champion uh, this issue. This is why we are introducing a much tougher sanctions regime on Russia. And as I have said, we will be bringing forward the Economic Crime Bill to add to the work we are already doing to tackle illicit finance. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I am uh, grateful also for sight uh, of the statement, and uh, we would support it. I have already said then in this House that the SNP will be part of the coalition to defend Ukraine and, indeed, our democracy. Uh, so it is not a blank cheque, because we will want to see some details, but you can uh, rest assured, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the SNP will stand behind these measures. I would be particularly grateful, though, for a reassurance that Scottish, land, Scottish limited partnerships will be included within the package, because they are a clear uh, risk in terms of dubious transactions. Also, that property transactions need to be part of it as well, and a reassurance of coordination with the EU, precisely to avoid asset flight, given that these measures have been telegraphed. But as well, and I do want an answer to this one, I have pledged the SNP's support for this. I do want a, a, a statement from the Foreign Secretary in response to Pippa Crerar, who is the political editor of the Daily Mirror's uh, report today, an impeccable journalist with impeccable sources, that there was supposed to be a call between the Prime Minister and President Putin today. But, and I quote here, when the Grey report landed, the Russians were asked to shift the time, but they couldn't, so it's off. What in the name of hell impression does that give to our friends and our allies, if it's true? Perhaps it's not. I'd be grateful for an assurance that it's not true, and if it is true, 
I would be grateful for an assurance that that conversation will take place. Thank you. Honourable Secretary. I can reassure the Honourable Gentleman that absolutely nothing is off the table in, in terms of who and which organisations we will target with these sanctions. Uh, we are very committed to working with our partners, including the EU, and we had a big discussion at the G7 in Liverpool about the sanctions regime. I have had discussions since then uh, with Joseph Burrell and my EU counterparts to make sure we are fully coordinated, as well as with the US and the Prime Minister. I uh, will shortly be speaking to President Putin, and as I have said, I will be travelling to Moscow in the, next four, in the next fortnight to speak to my counterpart, Sergei Lavrov. Um, sorry. Um, Dr Julian Lewis. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Cutting out a cancer is both painful and dangerous. Is the Foreign Secretary aware that the previous Intelligence and Security Committee in its Russia report drew upon the expertise of Edward Lucas, who today has a, a comment column in the Times headed, Britain has become addicted to dirty money. May I suggest that if she wants to be sure that this cancer is indeed going to be cut out of the body politic and the wider country's economy, she could do far worse than to consult Mr Lucas before she finalises her proposed sanctions and their structures. Okay. Well, I thank my honourable friend for his suggestion. I'd be very happy to meet uh, the gentleman he mentions. Stephen Kinnock. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The government said six months ago that it was finalising its report into how more yep. than 700 Russian millionaires were fast tracked for British residency yep. via its so called oh. Golden Visa scheme. Yep. Can the Foreign Secretary tell the House when this long overdue report is going to be published? And does she agree with me that the reason for the delay relates directly to the £4 million that has been donated to the Conservative yep. Party yeah. yep. by seven individuals who have deep and highly dubious links yeah. to the Kremlin? The exact yeah. oh, Secretary. We are reviewing the Tier 1 visas that were granted before the 5th of April, and uh, I am sure the Home Secretary will have further to say about that in due course. Tobias Elwood. Mr Deputy Speaker, could I welcome both the statement and the wider steps the UK is taking to support uh, Ukraine. My concern is that Western tactical responses are actually playing into Putin's own strategy. Seeking meetings with Putin, for example, actually plays to his self-importance. Any sanctions actioned will drive Russia ever closer to China exactly what Putin wants to do. And sending NATO reinforcements around Ukraine but not in it, is not the way to deter an attack. I worry that we are missing the bigger picture. Putin is using this Ukraine crisis to geopolitically realign Russia militarily, economically and geopolitically with China, with massive security implications for the West. Would my right honourable friend agree the only way to halt an invasion and check this dangerous trajectory is to support Ukraine militarily? This is our Cuban Missile Crisis. I encourage Britain to lead the call to deploy an offensive alliance and stand up to Putin's aggression. One second, Ray. Our approach in dealing with this issue uh, of Russian aggression is both deterrence and diplomacy. That's why the UK has been at the forefront in supplying defensive weapons to Ukraine, in training up uh, Ukrainian forces and working with our allies, many of whom are also supplying defensive support into Ukraine. But we have to be clear that there is a difference uh, between a member of NATO uh, who does have a security guarantee such as you know, Baltic states like Estonia, uh, where UK, UK troops are in place and the situation in Ukraine. And in my view, the best way of deterring uh, Vladimir Putin from an invasion of Ukraine is, first of all, making it very clear that this will not be simple or easy. This is likely to result in a quagmire, as we have seen in the Soviet-Afghan war, or indeed in Chechnya. And secondly, that there will be severe economic consequences. And those severe economic consequences are, of course, sanctions that target oligarchs and target companies. Uh, close to Vladimir Putin, 
but also uh, the not going ahead of Nord Stream 2, I also think is very important for the Russian point of view. But it is important, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that we do talk to Russia and we do communicate these messages. We will not resile uh, from our position about the protection of the open door policy into NATO, but we will communicate direct with Russia so they understand those messages. Kevin Jones. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Foreign Secretary comes to the House and talks tough and says that the government has a readiness to act. It's four years now since the Foreign Affairs Committee produced its Russia Gold Report, which outlined corruption uh, in the UK. It's two years since the Intelligence Security Committee uh, published its report into Russia, which outlined similar uh, concerns. Why has the government not acted in those years? And can I ask her if we are going to implement sanctions. How can we believe that will be effective without a strong political will and determination to actually make them work? Well, we have taken a number of measures in recent years, namely the Criminal Finances Act 2017, the review we're conducting of visas. And what I'm saying is that the most far-reaching sanctions regime will be in place by the 10th of February making sure that Russia understands that there is a severe package registry in place. And of course, I am absolutely prepared to do what is necessary to make those costs severe. John Whittingdale. Um, my right honourable friend is right that our argument is with President Putin and his cronies and not with the Russian people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she will be aware that Russian citizens, and indeed many in eastern Ukraine, are able only to access Russian propaganda from yes. state-owned or oligarch-owned media channels, while independent journalists are put into prison and the internet is censored. Will she look to see what more can be done, perhaps through the BBC World Service and the tech platforms, to ensure that the Russian people are able to access objective and factual reporting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Secretary. Well, my, my right honourable friend makes an excellent point, and of course we're looking at all of the channels we can communicate through directly to the Russian people as well as to the Russian government and that is something that I will be looking to do on my visit to Russia when I go there. Chris Bryant. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. This is just weak, weak, weak. Honestly, for, since 2010, when the, when the Conservatives came to power and they first started saying they wanted to press the reset button with Putin, we have been weak, ambivalent and vacillating towards the Russian Federation. And we have no quarrel with the Russian people. It is with President Putin. It doesn't work to try to look tough when you've refused to deal with the issue of tier one visas. It's shocking that the Foreign Secretary yeah. doesn't even have a proper answer to that exactly. question this afternoon. Right. This has been going on for ages. We've been giving them out to thousands of Russian oligarchs. Um, she still hasn't got an answer, or I hope maybe she will have an answer now, to the question about um, unexplained wealth orders. If we can't do them, how is this new legislation exactly. going to make any difference? At all. This is far, far too late. It's yeah. not a question of the horse has bolted. They've invited the horse in, sat it down at the table, and given it plenty to eat. Yeah. 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 I suggest the honourable gentleman that he goes to Ukraine and asks the Ukrainian, ask the Ukrainian government which, which of their allies do they think is giving them the most support. The answer is the United Kingdom has supplied more defensive weapons to Ukraine than any other of our other NATO allies. Order, Foreign Secretary, one, one moment, please. The question has been asked. Let's hear the answer. Foreign Secretary. The answer, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the Ukrainian government are very grateful for the support the United Kingdom is given. And we are the largest supplier of all of the European NATO allies of defensive weapons to Ukraine. Uh, we have helped train up the Ukrainian forces. We are providing economic support. And the sanctions package that I am announcing today goes far further than the EU sanctions regime that the Honourable Gentleman presumably supports. Dr Fox. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I very much welcome what my right honourable friend has said today. And it's quite understandable and right that our focus is currently on Ukraine. But isn't this just part 
of a bigger picture. What we have is a Russia that is trying to build an arc of instability around NATO, from the Arctic through the Baltic to the Balkans and the Caucasus. And doesn't this require a sustained and consistent and strong policy of deterrence, utilising diplomatic and economic and military elements? And wouldn't a good start be that all those who are members of NATO carry their fair share of the defence spending burden? Yeah, yeah, like Germany. My, my right honourable friend is absolutely right, and that is why the UK is supplying support right from the high north uh, through to the Baltic, through to the Black Sea, uh, back, backing up NATO and being the largest defence spender of all of the European NATO allies. And that is being recognised, contrary uh, to what those on the opposition benches say. That is being recognised by our allies in the Baltic, by our allies in Eastern Europe, and by our allies in Ukraine. Mark Pritchard. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Mark. You have to wait one moment. I was caught up in the moment. <laughs> Leila Moran. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. We can't sanction what we can't see. And while I welcome this statement, what I'd like some clarity on is whether or not this new legislation is going to finally include a register of beneficial owners for overseas entities, because the Foreign Secretary will know that many of these oligarchs hide their money, particularly in UK property. The press release from the FCDO says that it's going to leave them nowhere to hide. Or is this hole finally going to be closed? Good point. Good point. Good question. What the legislation we are putting forward is about is about being t- able to target entities and individuals that are of strategic or economic interest to the Russian state. So it's broadening it out much more widely than before, where we would only be able to apply sanctions to those who are actively desta- destabilising Ukraine. So this is, we can target asset freezing, uh, we can target the uh, ability to enter the UK of those individuals and entities. The register of interest she's talking about is part of the Economic Crime Bill. That is something being brought forward by the Treasury uh, and the Prime Minister is committed that that will happen this year. Mr Pritchard. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Oh, sorry, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We're both, we're both at it. I apologise. So, can I uh, welcome the Foreign Secretary's statement today and the announcement of uh, new powers? Uh, long overdue, but I'm glad it's this government that's delivering and delivering uh, by the 10th of February. Can I say to her that this will also be welcomed by the Rada uh, in Kiev uh, and also by the government of, of Ukraine? Is it not the case that Ukraine is not uh, NATO's border, it is not the EU's border, but it is democracy's border, and that is why Ukraine matters? And can I thank her for her good offices, working hard, galvanising opinion both in Washington and across EU capitals to ensure that we have that strong defence, strong deterrence and strong diplomacy? Well... First of all, can I thank my honourable friend for his work as chair of the all-party uh, Ukraine group. Ukraine is vitally important. It is a freedom-loving democracy in Europe. And if we don't work hard, which we are, to defend Ukraine from Russian aggression, that will simply encourage aggressors around the world. That is, this is not just a regional security issue, important though this is. It's a global security issue. I'm grateful, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Like my honourable friend, I support much of what's in the statement. And the statement says that she won't, she won't name who or what may be targeted with uh, sanctions. But can she clarify that whatever the new legislation looks like, it will enable the government to take an- action against Kremlin mouthpieces and outlets in this country, for example, RT UK. 
Well, as, a, as I've said, we, I am not going to talk about the individuals or entities could, that could be targeted, but it will be anyone who is of strategic interest to the Russian state or economic interest to the Russian state, and you can imagine that is quite a broad list of people and entities. Alex Shalbrook. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. My right honourable friend will know very well that Kiev was the original capital of Rus and was an area of fabulous wealth and education until invaded by the Khans and the Russians and the Rusians called them the Tartars. Now, there's many um, reports that have come out of tens of thousands of Tartars have disappeared yeah. from Crimea. And this human rights atrocity is not being able to be properly investigated. So does my right honourable friend agree with me that we must try and find out exactly what has been happening um, to um, the Tartar population? And equally, for those who do not feel it is important or we should somehow let Russia have the Russian Empire, as, as President Putin outlined in his essay last year, that that goes against every principle of freedom and democracy of standing up to fascist yeah, yeah. governments yeah, yeah. who want to ethnically cleanse people over centuries of hatred. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very good question. My, my honourable friend is completely right, and let's remember that Russia actually signed up to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity in the 1994 Budapest Agreement. They signed up to this, and what they are seeking to do is renege on their commitments uh, to stoke aggression and to seek to undermine Ukrainian democracy in a variety of ways, whether it's false flag operations, whether it's cyber attacks, or whether it's trying to install puppet regimes in Kiev. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. A few minutes ago, the Prime Minister stood at that dispatch box and said, in response to questions on Partygate, and I quote, this is the government which is bringing countries together to stand up against Putin. But just last week, our closest allies said they went, pub they went public with their concerns over f Russian exactly. influence in this country. Yeah, exactly. So will the Secretary of State admit that the, her government has undermined our diplomatic status and our national security by refusing for so long to take seriously Russian influence and dirty money. Yeah. 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 I don't accept the Honourable Lady's talking down of the UK role. It was at the G7 meeting in Liverpool <laughs> that we agreed with our allies, including the United States, including the EU and including Japan that the Russian regime would face severe consequences on an incursion with Ukraine. And that language has now been adopted by all of our allies and partners. We've led the way in providing defensive weaponry to Ukraine. We've led the way, as we are today, with our package of economic sanctions, which goes beyond uh, what we were able to do as a member of the EU. If you can. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The time for deterrence diplomacy is now. Over the last two weeks, from Kramatorsk to Donetsk, from Kiev to Sarajevo and Mostar, civilians have been clear with me that they believe the West will either save them or there will be bloodshed in Europe. What consideration has my right honourable friend given to blacklisting Russian banks? And will she look at joining the US in sanctioning Milorad Dodik in Bosnia, whose ethno-nationalist, um, separatist, genocide-denying agitation also risks bringing bloodshed to Euro? Yeah, yeah, well, done, Monsieur. well my, I know my uh, honourable friend has recently been on a visit uh, to the Western Balkans, and we are absolutely looking at what more we can do on sanctions uh, to the regime there, as well as how we target some of the Russian entities she talked about. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Any war on the borders between Ukraine and Russia will be utterly disastrous for the people of Ukraine, the people of Russia, and the future of um, peace across the whole of the continent of Europe. So when she travels to Moscow to have discussions with the Russian government, I hope she will be able to reassert the agreements reached in the 1990s in recognizing Ukrainian independence. But will she also try and take the whole thing a stage further and a new disarmament agreement with Russia, revisiting the previous agreements, and will she ensure that the British government, the British 
state is represented at the uh, Vienna Convention on Nuclear Weapons in the middle of March as a way of taking forward de-escalation of stress and threats, as a way of uh, winding down the tensions on the border. Because if we carry on building up massive troops on both sides of the border, something awful is going to happen and it will be very hard to get out of it. Let's be clear here, it's the Russian regime that have amassed the tanks and troops on the Ukrainian border. It is the Russian regime that have escalated aggression, not just towards Ukraine, but also through Belarus and in the Western Balkans. And it's the Russian regime that needs to step back before they end up entering into what could be, and I do agree with the honourable gentleman on that point, a very serious quagmire with appalling consequences for the people of both Ukraine and Russia. And that is the point I will be making uh, when I travel to Moscow in the next fortnight. Bob Seeley. Mr Speaker, I, I thank the Secretary of State for her very robust approach. Uh, and this is not a criticism of her, but we still lack a comprehensive and coherent approach to dealing with Russia's hybrid war. This is frankly a decade too late, so no criticism of her and clearly deterrence isn't working. My question is on UK facilitators, which has been mentioned by a few other people. Does she understand how corrosive it is to have young UK service personnel, ordinary kids in uniform, in forward position, in the Baltics, whilst a morally vacant and corrupted class in London of lawyers, bankers, reputation launderers and compromise style private investigators coin it serving the needs of a parasitic, murderous oligarch class who are part of a neo-fascist regime now threatening war in Europe. What are we doing about this corrupt facilitator class? Well, as I outlined earlier, we have taken action against illicit finance and corruption. Uh, we've established the National Cyber Security Centre. Uh, we're working very hard to support Ukraine. Uh, on the cyber attacks they're facing from the Russian regime. And what I've announced today is a sanctions regime, but which is by far the toughest sanctions regime that we have, uh, we've ever had against Russia. Hilary Benn. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, the Foreign Secretary's announcement today shows that the government can act very speedily when it wants to. The, these measures will be on the statute book by the 10th of February. Can she therefore explain to the House why we are still waiting for all of the other measures that my right honourable friend, the Shadow Foreign Secretary, referred to in his response to the statement? Why can't those be acted on as speedily as the yep. sanctions she's announced to the House today? Well, as I've said, we have put through the Criminal Finances Act 2017, our global anti corruption sanctions regime. We're reviewing the Tier 1 visas, and we will introduce the Economic Crime Bill, which is uh, something that Her Majesty's Treasury is working on. Daniel Kaczynski. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Foreign Secretary is absolutely correct in highlighting that our partners in Central and Eastern Europe, Poland and the Baltic States, recognise the leadership that Britain is uh, providing with regards to these new tensions, but they also recognise the increasing divergence between London and Berlin in terms of how to tackle Russia over these uh, nefarious uh, behaviour. Uh, will she agree with me that it's important now to go back to our German partners and re-emphasise the need for them to stop the Nord Stream 2 pipeline? It gives the Russians an umbilical cord to the heart of Europe. We import less than 1.5% of our gas uh, requirements from, from uh, Russia. The Germans import over 60% of their energy requirements from Moscow. I had a discussion with my colleague, Foreign Minister Babok, uh, last week about precisely this issue, and I do welcome the statements from her and Chancellor Stoltz on Nord Stream 2, being very clear that it won't go ahead in the event of a uh, Russian incursion. We do need to reduce dependence on Russian gas. 
I welcome the work the United States is doing to look at how supplies can be augmented. Uh, we're working with partners across the Middle East. This is a strategic issue for Europe, and we do need to reduce dependence on Russian gas. There's no doubt about it. Anna McMurrin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Over £4 million has been donated to Tory MPs, including to a quarter of the current cabinet by Russian-linked individuals. Great. Dirty money. Is this, and this is from an evil regime. Is this why the government has so far failed to take the Russian threat to our democracy so seriously? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how will what's announced today help? Yep. And also, will she pledge to this House to fly at least business class to Moscow in the next couple of weeks, instead of using half a million pounds of taxpayers' money, as she did when she flew to Australia. We have government planes for a reason. It's for government ministers to use on government business. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In addition to targeted sanctions against Kremlin-linked individuals, our friends and allies in the US Senate are considering three further steps. One would be to sanction uh, Russian state banks to prevent the flow of foreign capital. Secondly, would be to have export controls on key technologies that are useful to the Kremlin. And thirdly, a number of senators led by Ted Cruz in the US Senate are proposing a return to sanctions against Nord Stream itself and related entities and individuals linked to the organisation. Will each of those be included in the bill that she intends to bring forwards? Well, as I've said, the legislation we're bringing forward is very wide-ranging and targets a number of sectors and interests in relation to the Kremlin. And I can assure my honourable friend that nothing is off the table. Ben Bradshaw. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Our American allies have just issued an unprecedented rebuke to yeah. the British government, um, saying that any new sanctions would be worthless as long as London remains the main international laundry mat for, laundry mat for dirty Russian yeah. money. And I remember this Prime Minister tried to sh stop the publication of the Russia report and remove the whip from the Right Honourable Gentleman, who now chairs the Intelligence and Security Committee, when his own Patsy candidate failed to get the job. I'm still not clear, though, whether she is reinstating the Economic Crime Bill, because that's not been said on the record yeah. from the dispatch box yeah. before. If she is, can the admirable Lord Agnew have his job back, please? <laughs> <laughs> so, as I have said already this afternoon, we remain committed to bringing in the Economic Crime Bill, and the Prime Minister committed uh, that that would be done this year. Richard Drax. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The right honourable friend from North Somerset rather took my thunder, but it's such an important point I'd like to raise it if I'm reiterated. If ever there was a reason to take a fresh look at NATO and its role and responsibilities, this threat by Russia of invasion in Europe must be it. Can my right honourable friend uh, tell us, are the other NATO countries that are not spending 2%, has she spoken to them? Has she given the reassurance that they will spend 2%? And if they haven't, what does she intend to do to make them spend 2% of their GDP? We are already spending more than 2% of our GDP. We're the largest European NATO supplier of uh, troops and security around, around Europe. And we want to see others step up. Because, as the Honourable Gentleman says, these threats are getting worse. Uh, we've seen an increase in aggression. And we need to see all NATO allies step up and fulfil their commitments. Caroline Lucas. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. The government's attempt to claim some kind of moral high ground on the issue of Russian sanctions is sheer hypocrisy when her party has accepted donations from oligarchs, her government has turned a blind eye to Kremlin meddling in our democracy and has held open the door to Putin's cronies to have their money laundered in London. So can she tell us whether that is the reason that there is still this delay when it comes to the promised register of overseas entities to shine a light on Russian ownership of British property? In her replies both to the Honourable Member for Exeter and indeed for Oxford West and Abingdon, she showed a remarkable lack of urgency. To know that this Economic Crimes Bill might come sometime this year is not good enough when we're talking about what pressure can be brought to bear on Russia now. 
Well, I hoped the Honourable Lady would welcome the fact that we are introducing our toughest ever sanction regime on Russia, which will be pl in place by the 10th of February. We are acting with urgency to deal with this crisis. Rick Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I warmly welcome the actions my right honourable friend is taking. Uh, there should indeed be nobody who thinks they are safe from sanctions. So can the Foreign Secretary confirm that this new legislation will ensure that any company of interest to the Kremlin would be able to be targeted so that there could be nowhere to hide for Putin's oligarchs? We will be able to target any company that is linked to the Russian state, engages in business and economic significance to the Russian state, or in a sector of strategic significance. And we won't just be able to target those entities. We will be able to go after those who own or control them. So the net is very wide. Ruth Cadbury. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'm going to give the Foreign Secretary a third chance. Does she agree that the UK will continue the UK government will continue to look weak on the Russian threat while Tory MPs and members of the other house continue to accept cash from Russian linked individuals? Well, I do, had hoped the honourable lady would be welcoming the package of tough sanctions we're introducing today. In fact, that is what our allies across the world are saying. Yeah. Okay, Mr Speaker, I thank the Foreign Secretary for her statement. She is absolutely right. We do need to widen the breadth of sanctions on Russia to reflect the reality on the ground. In my constituency of the cities of London and Westminster, those realities are very clear to see of the dirty money that is being invested week in, week out. Can my right honourable friend give me assurances that this government will follow through on the legislation and ensure that the financial services and professional services involved will be held to account and that we take a banks and tanks strategy to fight corruption and the, uh, the uh, aggression that Russia is showing to Ukraine and across Europe? We, we have taken steps to deal with illicit finance and corrupt elites through the Criminal Finance Act 2017, our anti-corruption sanctions regime. I have already talked about the commitment to bringing in legislation through the Economic Crime Bill. But what this is about today is showing that the UK is ready with a package of severe sanctions that could target any organisation or individual who is remotely uh, linked to the Russian state or indeed of economic significance to the Russian state, showing that there will be nowhere to hide in the event of an incursion into Ukraine. And this is about making sure that those economic consequences are as severe as possible. Uh, the Honourable Lady, my Honourable Friend, makes some you know, excellent points around the broader issue. But what we are talking today is about deterring Vladimir Putin from an incursion into Ukraine. And it's Lauder. Mr Deputy Speaker, why has the government delayed the Economic Crime Bill? Why is it doing nothing to stop lawfare in the UK courts? Why is the serious fraud office being sued by oligarchs rather than indicting them? Without the laws, the courts and the prosecutors yeah. to tackle corruption and dirty money here in Londonograd, <laughs> aren't her threats empty and vacuous? And, and by the way, will she ensure that the Tories' Russian gold it finds its way back to Moscow? Yeah. 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 Well, I've answered already the steps that Her Majesty's Treasury uh, and the uh, Ministry of Justice are taking on the issues that he talked about. But under direct uh, Foreign Office control is the sanctions regime. That is why we are taking action as soon as we can by the, by the 10th of February to get these sanctions in place so that we can exercise them in the event of an incursion. Dr Luke Evans. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I'm grateful for the Foreign Secretary for her announcement on sanctions today. I noticed in her statement she said the UK will be joining discussions at the UN Security Council to apply further pressure on Russia today. Um, could she explain what she hopes to gain out of this and what a success would look like? 
Well, Russia is a member of the Permanent Security Council, and they need to be held to account for their aggressive actions with respect to Ukraine. Dave Dugan. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I too welcome the broad tenet of the uh, statement from the Foreign Secretary. Can I ask her, though, the detail within her statement that this details uh, fast jets to go and bolster uh, NATO forces in Europe, has she had discussions with the Ministry of Defence in order to ensure that, when quite appropriately bolstering Ukraine's eastern flank, we are not creating any problems for the United Kingdom's northern flank by redeploying Typhoon QRA aircraft from either Lossiemouth or Coningsby? Very good. Well, I, I am in regular touch with the Defence Secretary to make sure, of course, we protect UK defence interests at the same time as providing air support, particularly around the Black Sea region to make sure uh, we are working with our NATO allies to keep a free and safe Europe. Jonathan Edwards. Mr. Deputy Speaker, President Putin is reported as saying whoever becomes the leader in the sphere of artificial intelligence will become the ruler of the world. Considering the dangers posed by lethal autonomous weapons, can she explain why the British government seems reluctant to support efforts to place legally binding instruments to control their development and use? Well, we are shortly about to launch our international tech strategy, which will talk precisely about setting standards in areas like artificial intelligence, areas like quantum, because it's important that it is the free world uh, that is setting those standards rather than being dictated by authoritarian regimes. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. There are concerns from the food industry that a Russian invasion of Ukraine could lead to food shortages in the UK. As, as Ukraine is becoming a significant exporter of goods like cereal products to the UK, what plans does the government have to protect UK food supplies if Putin opts to disregard sanctions and presses ahead? Well, we do have an um, important trade relationship with Ukraine, which is why it's so important that we support Ukraine economically. Uh, that's why we've built in extra trade cooperation, and it's why it's so important that we deter uh, the Russian government from an incursion into Ukraine. I'd like to thank the Foreign Secretary for her statement today and answering questions uh, five minutes short of an hour. Thank you. We'll pause slightly as people leave and take over. Order. Order. We now come to the third statement today from the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care. Sajid Javid. Mr Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I would like to update the House on the vaccination as condition of deployment. Last Thursday, we woke up to a new phase of this pandemic as we returned to Plan A. People are no longer advised to work from home. Face coverings are no longer mandatory. Organisations no longer have to require the NHS COVID pass. And from today, there is no limit on the number of visitors allowed to care homes. Week by week, we are carefully moving from our, our COVID response from one of rules and restrictions to back to one of personal responsibility. We are able to do this because of the defences that we have built throughout this pandemic in vaccines and antivirals, in testing and surveillance. We know, of course, that COVID-19 is here to stay. While some countries remain stuck on a zero COVID strategy and others think about how they will safely open up, here we are showing the way forward and showing the world what successfully living with COVID looks like. The principle we are applying is the same principle that has guided our actions throughout this pandemic, and that is to achieve the maximum protection of public health with the minimum intrusion in people's everyday lives. To me, that is what learning to live with COVID is all about. Even with this progress, Mr Deputy Speaker, we must, of course, remain vigilant. While overall cases and hospitalisations continue to fall, we are seeing rises in cases in primary and secondary school children. 
Part of living with COVID means living with new variants and sub-variants. Our world-class health surveillance operations are currently keeping a close watch on a sub-variant of Omicron called BA2, which the UK Health Security Agency has marked as a variant under investigation, one below a variant of concern. 1,072 genomically confirmed cases of BA2 have been identified in England, while early data from Denmark suggests that BA2 may be more transmissible, there is currently no evidence that it is any more severe. In addition, an, an initial analysis of vaccine effectiveness against BA2 reveals a similar level of protection to symptomatic infection compared to BA1, the original variant of Omicron, which underlines, once again, the importance of being vaccinated against COVID-19 and the imperative to get the booster if you're eligible. Mr Deputy Speaker, nowhere is vaccination more important than in our health and social care system. Throughout this pandemic, we've always put the safety of vulnerable people first, and we always will do. It has always been this government's expectation that everyone gets vaccinated against COVID-19, especially those people working in health and social care settings who have a professional duty to do so. When designing policy, there will always be a balance of opportunities and risks, and responsible policy making must take that balance into account. When we consulted on vaccination as a condition of deployment in health and wider social care settings, the evidence showed that the vaccine effectiveness against infection from the dominant Delta variant has been or was between 65 and 80 per cent, depending on which of the vaccines that you had received. It was clear that vaccination was the very best way to keep vulnerable people safe from Delta. Because, quite simply, if you're not infected, you can't infect someone else. Balanced against this clear benefit was the risk that there would always be some people who would not do the responsible thing and choose to remain unvaccinated, and in doing so, choosing to walk away from their jobs in health and care. Despite it being their choice to leave their jobs, we have to consider the impact on the workforce in NHS and social care settings, especially at a time when we already have a shortage of workers and near full employment across the economy. In December, I argued, and this House overwhelmingly agreed, that the weight of clinical evidence in favour of vaccination as a condition of deployment outweighed the risks to the workforce. It was the right policy at the time, supported by the clinical evidence, and the government makes no apology for it. It has also proven to be the right policy in retrospect, given the severity of Delta. Since we launched the consultation on vaccination as a condition of deployment in the NHS and wider social care settings in September, there has been a net increase of 127,000 people working across the NHS who have done the right thing and got jabbed, becoming part of the 19 out of 20 NHS workers who have done their professional duty. During the same time, we have also seen a net increase of 32,000 people getting jabbed in social care, including 22,000 people in care homes and 10,000 people working in domiciliary care. I'm grateful to the millions of health and care colleagues who have come forward to do the right thing, and the health and care leaders who have supported them. Together, they've played a vital part in raising our wall of protection even higher and keeping thousands of vulnerable people out of hospital this summer. When we laid the November regulations, the Delta variant represented 99% of infections. A few short weeks later, we discovered Omicron, which has now become the dominant variant in the UK, representing over 99% of infections. Incredibly, over a third of the UK's total number of COVID-19 cases have happened in just the last eight weeks. Given that Delta has been replaced, it's only right that our policy on vaccination as a condition of deployment is reviewed. 
So I ask for fresh advice, including from the UK Health Security Agency and England's Chief Medical Officer. In weighing up the risks and opportunities of this policy once again, there are two new factors. The first is that our population as a whole is now better protected against hospitalisation from COVID-19. Omicron's increased infectiousness means that at the peak of the recent winter spike, one in 15 people had a COVID-19 infection, according to the ONS. Around 24% of England's population has had at least one positive COVID-19 test. And as of today in England, 84% of people over 12 have had a primary course of COVID-19 vaccines and 64% have been boosted, including over 90% of over 50s. The second factor is that the dominant variant, Omicron, is intrinsically less severe. When taken together with the first factor that we now have greater population protection, the evidence shows that the risk of presentation to emergency care or hospital admission with Omicron is approximately half of that for Delta. Given these dramatic changes, it is not only right but responsible to revisit the balance of risks and opportunities that guided our original decision last year. While vaccination remains our very best line of defence against COVID-19, I believe that it is no longer proportionate to require vaccination as a condition of deployment through statute. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, today I am announcing that we will launch a consultation on ending vaccination as a condition of deployment in health and all social care settings. Subject to the responses and the will of this House, the Government will revoke the regulations. I have always been clear that our rules must remain proportionate and balanced. And of course, should we see another dramatic change in the virus, it would be only responsible to review this policy again. Madam Deputy Speaker, some basic facts remain, of course. Vaccines save lives. And everyone working in health and social care has a professional duty to be vaccinated against COVID-19. So while we will seek to end vaccination as a condition of deployment in health and social care settings using statute, I am taking the following steps. First, I have written to professional regulators operating across health to ask them to urgently review current guidance to registrants on vaccinations, including COVID-19, to emphasise their professional responsibilities in this area. Second, I have asked the NHS to review its policies on the hiring of new staff and the deployment of existing staff, taking into account their vaccination status. And third, I have asked my officials to consult on updating my department's code of practice, which applies to all CQC registered providers of all healthcare and social care settings in England. They will consult on strengthening requirements in relation to COVID-19 including reflecting the latest advice on infection protection control. And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, our vital work to promote the uptake of vaccines continues, and I'm sure that the whole House will want to join me in thanking NHS trusts and care providers for their relentless efforts in putting patient safety first. Madam Deputy Speaker, I also wish to thank the Shadow Health Secretary and the party opposite for their support of the Government's approach to this policy area. One of the reasons that we have the highest vaccine uptake rates in the world is because of the confidence our vaccines that, that, that comes, the confidence that comes from this place, from all sides of the House. We may not agree on everything, but when it comes to vaccination, together we have put the national interest first. It is now in our national interest to embark on this new phase of the pandemic where we keep the British people safe while showing the world how we can successfully learn to live with COVID-19. I commend this statement to the House. Shadow Secretary of State. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank the Secretary of State for advanced sight of his statement today. Uh, and can I also thank him for his regular contact and briefings on this issue at both ministerial and official level. Uh, he's right to say that we've worked with the government to ensure uh, maximum take-up of the vaccine across 
uh, health and social care, uh, and we don't regret that decision. Indeed, we welcome the decision that he's come to today. And let me be clear from the start: vaccines are safe, effective, and the best defence that we have against the virus. Whether compulsory or not, it remains the professional duty of all NHS and care workers to get themselves vaccinated, as it is the duty of all of us in order to protect ourselves, to protect our loved ones and to protect our society from the greater spread of infections and hospitalisations and from the need for harsh restrictions that impact on our lives, our livelihoods and our liberties. The debate over this policy is about whether the state should mandate the vaccine for health and care staff or if it should take a voluntary approach. It is not a discussion over the need to get vaccinated, the arguments for which are overwhelmingly one-sided. With five million people in the UK still to have their first jab, we cannot afford to take our foot off the pedal in getting the message out. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, we on these benches supported the initial policy in early December. Six, since then, we have seen a significant increase in vaccinations among NHS staff, with tens of thousands more staff now protected. And I want to say an enormous thank you to the NHS Trust, who have worked tirelessly to persuade hesitant staff of the need to get vaccinated, of those colleagues who have given up considerable time to have supported conversations with their peers and the health unions and royal colleges that, despite their misgivings about the mandatory nature of the policy, nonetheless did everything they could to encourage their members to get themselves vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Clearly, Madam Deputy Speaker, things have now moved on, both in terms of our overall levels of infections and in terms of our understanding of the latest variant. It has also become clear that to follow through with this policy could see tens of thousands of staff be forced to leave their roles at a time when our health service is already understaffed and overstretched. Indeed, this has been a particular anxiety on these benches and right across the House. However, efforts must continue to persuade those staff who are still hesitant. Can I ask the Secretary of State what lessons he and his department have learned from the Welsh Government where 95 per cent of staff were double jabbed by November without any mandate, and what we can learn from the Welsh Government's approach to persuasion and what we can do to emulate their success. In light of today's decision, it is all the more important that health and care workers are empowered to do the right thing and isolate when they need to, without the fear of being unable to feed their families. One in five care homes do not pay staff their full wages to isolate. If we are to learn to live well with COVID, this must change. Labour's plan for living well with COVID includes making all workers eligible for proper levels of sick pay. So I ask why the government has still not sorted this. And I appreciate these are Treasury issues too, but Madam Deputy Speaker, this approach is one that is penny wise and pound foolish when it comes to protecting public health. Madam Deputy Speaker, we supported this measure in December, put the national interest before party politics and made sure it had the votes needed to pass the House. We understand the difficulties faced today by the Government in coming to today's decision, and we will continue to be as constructive and helpful as we can be in a national crisis, as Labour has been throughout the past two years. So I welcome very much what the Secretary of State has said this afternoon, welcoming Labour support for this policy and indeed our wider support for the vaccination rollout. Uh, so let me just end on this point, Madam Deputy Speaker, and, and a point of criticism which is not in any way levelled at the Secretary of State. Given the way in which the Labour Party has handled our approach to the pandemic response and the constructive way in which we have sought to work with the Government, it is not unreasonable to expect the Prime Minister and others in his party to stop pretending that this hasn't been the case. Uh, and perhaps he might stop seeking to turn the pandemic, the greatest threat we have faced to our nation for over 70 years, into a party political mud fight. Surely, Madam Deputy Speaker, we can do better than that. And I'd like to think that myself and the Secretary of State have been leading by example. Secretary of State. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I 
once again thank the honourable gentleman uh, for his approach to this policy areas and, and vaccinations uh, in, in general. And he is absolutely right in the, in, in the comments he's made about that and the importance of uh, working a, across the House and working together on, on such an important issue in the national interest as he has done. And, and, uh, and I very much uh, welcome uh, that approach. I mean, uh, many, uh, not all countries have uh, such an approach to such an important issue, and they have sadly paid a price for that. And I do believe that one of the reasons that we have such high vaccine uptake in this country is because of the cross party approach that has been taken. And, I, and once again, I do thank the honourable gentleman uh, for that approach. And he's also right to, to point to the, uh, the safety and effectiveness of the vaccines as uh, independently uh, set out by our world-class regulator, the MHRA, and other reputable regulators uh, across the world. And, and no one should doubt the safety and effectiveness of, of, the, of the vaccines. It is because of the success of this country's vaccination programme that we are able uh, to open up again in the way that we have. We are able to start returning to normal life. And very importantly, for the people that we are talking about today, those working, those fantastic people working in the NHS and across social care, they're one of the key reasons why we've been able to keep down the pressure on uh, NHS in, in particular is because so many people have come forward and, and got vaccinated. And that's why it is, remains troubling, Madam Deputy Speaker, that, that there are still some people in the NHS in, in particular uh, that, that refuse to get vaccinated, even when they know that it is safe and effective, and, and do not do the responsible thing and act in a professional way. And so we will keep uh, that, 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 the, the, the work uh, that we will do to, to work with those people in a positive way and try to persuade them about the benefits of vaccination, provide them with the information that they, they need. Uh, we can continue uh, with the work of one-to-one -one meetings with clinicians if necessary and encourage them to make that positive choice. But it will be about encouragement and helping them to come uh, to, to the right uh, decision. And we will uh, learn and, and uh, look across the UK what other parts of the UK have done and making sure that we have the very best practice and have learned uh, from, uh, from each other. And then finally, on the, on the point of um, sick pay that the Honourable Gentleman uh, raised, that I do understand what he's saying. I will just point to the, the, the fact that we have kept rules in place that allow sick pay, pay to be claimed from uh, day one, and also there's a hardship uh, fund that is in place to give extra support where needed. Chair of the Health Select Committee, Jeremy. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. My right honourable friend knows that my instinct is to support him in the very difficult decisions he has to take in a pandemic, and I think he's doing an excellent job. But I do have some concerns about today's announcement. I think they're concerns that may not be shared widely in this House, so I hope my uh, colleagues will indulge me if I explain why. Frontline workers have done an extraordinary job in this pandemic, but I have yet to meet a single one that believes that anyone in contact with patients has a right to put them to increased risk by not having a vaccine unless there is a medical exemption. And my concern is that having marched the NHS to the top of the hill, having actually won a very important patient safety argument, we're now doing a U-turn. And my question is, what will happen the next time uh, the Secretary of State wants to introduce a, an important vaccine, for example, for flu and make it mandatory? And isn't the real reason that we made this decision because we have a staffing crisis to which the government has still not brought forward its plans to address? And when will those plans be brought forward? The, the, my right honourable friend uh, speaks with, with great experience, and uh, I have the utmost respect for him, especially given the, the many years that he has spent you know, successfully running uh, this department. And, and I do understand uh, what he says, and, and, and I hope he will, um, after, after having listened carefully to the statement, uh, hopefully understand as well that when the facts change, then it is right for the government to review the policy and determine whether it is still a proportionate. And the one thing, I mean, many things have changed in the last couple of months with respect to COVID, but the one big thing that has changed is that since this policy was originally implemented, we have moved from 99% of COVID infections being Delta to 99% uh, being Omicron. And that is the reason why we've had to change approach. SNP spokesperson Martin Day. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I am grateful to the Secretary of State 
for his statement and for advance sight of it. I welcome the intent to U-turn on vaccination as a condition of employment. I have never supported mandatory vaccination for workers, a policy which I'm pleased to say Scotland has avoided going down. And as we know, adding a further 70,000 or more vacancies to the existing 100,000 in NHS England would be a serious act of self-sabotage. Vaccines do remain one of the best defences against COVID-19, reducing the likelihood of infection and therefore breaking the chain of transmission, and something we should all continue to encourage. The Scottish Government has pursued an educate and encourage strategy in its vaccine rollout, a strategy which has resulted in a higher vaccine take-up to date through entirely voluntary take-up, with the five most vaccinated areas in the UK all being in Scotland. So why is the UK Government taking so long to drop its damaging policy and adopt the Scottish practice? When will the consultation conclude and a decision finally be made? And the UK Government's vaccination mandate may have alienated many NHS staff. So what will be done to repair relations and encourage a continued voluntary vaccine take-up? The, the Honourable Gentleman is, is right to draw the House's attention, uh, as other members have, to the importance of vaccination. It is, uh, 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 and I think uh, this is reflected in his remarks, it is uh, the UK's first line of defence against COVID. Thankfully, uh, we have, uh, as, uh, as the UK, uh, also uh, put in place many other defences with antivirals, uh, for example, used across the UK, the, the, the testing uh, the regime that we have, the surveillance regime. But vaccines are the first line of defence, and he's right to uh, talk about encouraging as many people as we possibly can, in, whether they work in health or social care or otherwise, but encouraging them uh, to, to take up vaccine if they have so far not done so. And, and, the, and the best approach uh, overall, as a general approach, he's right, is education and informing, and that's what we will continue to do. Esther McVeigh. Madam Deputy Speaker. What a disappointment this statement is today. Having read the newspapers, I was hoping I'd be able to come here and congratulate the Secretary of State um, that it, it, on the government's recent conversion to common sense in halting the mandatory vaccination process of NHS workers. Instead, what he's doing is doing a half and half decision today, knowing the Damocles sword hangs over those 100,000 NHS workers because they've got to have their first vaccination on Thursday. And then he will be sending them on a pathway to unemployment, along with thousands of other care workers who are already have lost their job. What I want to know is what is he now going to do to help those thousands of people get a job and what compensation will he be paying to them? Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm very happy to clarify the, the point that's been raised by my uh, right honourable friend. Uh, there, there will no, because the government has made a, a decision on this, which I've been, hopefully I've been very clear about uh, in, in my statement earlier, uh, whilst uh, the, for statutory reasons there needs to be a consultation, it will be a two-week consultation, <coughs> then there will be a SI uh, presented to the House, and obviously it will be subject to the, to the will of the House. The government has made its decision uh, on this, and uh, we, the NHS uh, will be writing today to all NHS trusts, and the department will be contacting uh, the, the, the um, uh, care home providers uh, to, uh, as well in, in the wider social care settings in domiciliary care uh, to make it clear that the deadline that my right honourable friend has referred to is no longer applicable. And so I'm very happy to, to make that clear. She's raised an important point, uh, but uh, whilst it is subject to this House, the, 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 there will be no uh, further enforcement uh, of the regulations for the reasons that I've set out today. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Health Secretary has not only bullied and threatened our NHS staff at a time when they are so fragile, but ignored the Royal Colleges and all of the trade unions in saying that the initial statutory instruments should not have been put. In fact, he hasn't made it clear today that both will be withdrawn, so I ask him to make that clear, but also to say that for all of those staff which to date have lost their employment, whether or not they will be reinstated with continuity of employment, including their pensions and their other conditions. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy to answer those questions, Madam Deputy Speaker. I mean, first of all, 
uh, the, the government's decision is to revoke both uh, statutory instruments, and so I'm happy to, uh, to confirm that. But when the Honourable Lady raises the issue of uh, those that, uh, that chose with the first statutory instrument, uh, so that's for care home settings, uh, chose not to get vaccinated and would rather leave their job than choose to get vaccinated, do the professional thing, that was their choice. And that doesn't change because the policy was the right policy at the time because the dominant variant was Delta, and I've set out the reasons for why. Should those people then choose now to apply to a care home once these, uh, for a job uh, once these uh, uh, restrictions have been uh, lifted, then that is a decision for them. But I would continue uh, to encourage them to make the right positive decision and get vaccinated. Sir Charles Walker. Sir, Madam Speaker, I, I promised my wife that I would stop being angry. And I just can't. Uh, these, these people that we cast as pariahs, long before vaccines existed, day in and day out, came into hospitals and care homes and held the hands of the dying because their children and grandchildren couldn't do that. They were doing this while most people in this house were sitting on their backsides safely at home. Now, by all means, let's encourage people to get vaccines, but the language we've used about this people, these people, who for whatever reason may be a needle phobia like me, who have chosen not to get vaccinated, are somehow deserving of our bile, is a disgrace, and it doesn't reflect badly on them, it reflects badly on us. I think my, what I hear from my honourable friend, and I very much uh, agree with him, is that the, an agreement that vaccines are safe, that they're effective, they are our most important weapon in fighting this pandemic, they remain our most important weapon, and the more people that come forward and choose to get vaccinated, not only is it good for them, it is right for the rest of society, their loved ones and everyone else around them, especially if those people around them are more vulnerable than, than most people in the population because they might be in a care setting or they might be uh, in, 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 the, in a hospital. And so uh, the, the best way forward is to encourage everyone, through encouragement now, to continue to think of the vaccine in that positive, sensible way and encourage them to come forward. Uh, Daisy Cooper. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I welcome this change of tack because I, like many others, um, oppose the um, compulsory vaccination policy, but I fear that um, in the care sector the damage has been done. We know reports that around 40,000 people have already left. So with this change of tack, could the Secretary of State tell us what his plans are to get more carers very quickly into the care sector, because it's damaging patient safety. And specifically with regard to the shortage occupation list, how many carers he hopes to recruit and by when? Yeah, we, um, first of all, uh, thank you uh, to the Honourable Lady. It's a, it's a good question. Um, just on the, uh, she's mentioned, uh, I think, the number of 40,000 people she referenced coming, uh, that have left care homes as a result of a uh, vaccine as a condition of deployment. Now, we, I, I can give her more information on that. And uh, the, the, whilst the, there is no exact data because care homes are independent, the, the people working in care homes are not employed uh, directly by the state. Uh, but uh, the, the best estimate that the department has is uh, from the industry itself, which is the, the, the change in, in workforce during the final half of last year, and that was 19,300. There's a fall of 19,300. So we don't believe the 40,000 number is representative. The best proxy number is 19,300. Having said that, uh, no one would want to see anyone leaving the care home sector when what we need, as she rightly identifies, is uh, more people uh, coming forward. And that is why uh, we've put in place a retention uh, fund of 162.5 million. This was before Omicron, and we added to that fund by over 300 million doing Omicron, and we are also supporting the sector in, in having its largest recruitment campaign that has ever run. Sir John Redwood. I welcome the change of policy. In order to reassure both patients and staff about safety, what progress can he report to the House on better air extraction, air cleaning and UV filtration? Because I think we do need to control the virus without telling people exactly what they have to do uh, in their own health treatments. Uh, it's a very good question, as always, for my right honourable friend. Uh, the, uh, there are, as he will know, uh, 
infection protection control measures that have been there since the pandemic. They, they do change uh, with the pandemic uh, over time, depending on the, on the risk profile, and that applies to uh, care settings. Uh, the, the government has supported uh, care homes with hundreds of millions of pounds to make uh, adaptions and changes and to implement uh, such measures. And I know that many uh, care settings uh, have taken advantage of that uh, with uh, air filtration, ventilation and other measures. And it's the kind of support that, continue, that will be continued to be given from the government. Henry Penn. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. This has always been a very difficult issue because it's about balancing two different sets of rights. And I think the Secretary of State has made a sensible choice. He talked about changing circumstances. The one thing that hasn't changed, however, is that there is still a considerable number of NHS staff who remain unvaccinated. Could he tell the House what representations in reaching this decision he has received from NHS leaders about the impact of those staff having to leave, which they won't now have to do, would have had on the ability of the NHS to cope. And was that a factor in reaching this decision? Because I think most of us sitting here today know that it probably was. Mm. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I hope I'd been clear uh, in my statement earlier, which I think uh, would answer the, the question, but I'm happy to, to emphasise it, uh, that, that has just come from the right honourable uh, gentleman. Um, as I said, that in coming to decision, any decision, but certainly this decision, uh, there, are, there are benefits and there are costs, uh, and that's what I refer to in my statement. And the, and the cost I was referring to is that there will ultimately be some people that would uh, no longer be employed in the NHS or in care settings, and, and that balance remains important. And because of the change in the variant and the uh, uh, real change in the, in the benefit part of the equation, uh, the scales tilted, and that is why uh, I, I no longer think the policy uh, as set out is proportionate. Here in case. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I welcome my right honourable friend's um, statement and thank him for listening to those of us on both sides of the House who have uh, raised concerns about this policy. And of course, it's right to change policy in the light of new evidence, particularly in this case, uh, the evidence that Omicron is less severe uh, and that vaccines are no longer as effective in reducing transmission. But given that reducing transmission was the only reason for pushing ahead with the vaccination of children, will he now commit to a review of that policy, given that children are almost no risk from COVID, but that there are small but potentially significant risks, both known and unknown, particularly to boys, from COVID vaccinations? Yeah, uh, can I thank my uh, honourable friend for her remarks? And on her particular question around uh, children and vaccines, I mean, she will know that when it comes to vaccination in general, that we take advice from the expert uh, committee of the JCVI, and as she would rightly expect, they do keep uh, vaccination decisions under review at all times. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I hope the Secretary of State can actually recognise the very important message given by the unions and the Royal Colleges only seven weeks ago of the short-sightedness of a compulsion policy which would drive people, vital workers, out of the care sector and of the NHS. And I hope that we will never go down the road of compulsory vaccination. I support vaccination, but persuasion is much more powerful than compulsion. Persuasion, where people understand it, is far more, a far more powerful message to get across. And could he also tell us, what is the cost of each vaccine to each resident of this country, and what is the cost of its manufacture, and if he has any plans for the patent to be moved into public ownership so the massive profiteering out of these vaccinations can end and the public can get the benefit of it? I, where I agree with the right honourable gentleman is on the importance of uh, persuasion in, in, in vaccination. Where I'm afraid I do disagree with him is the idea that public ownership of, of patents around vaccinations or drug development in general would help. Uh, indeed, I think it would be a backward step and we would not see the innovation that has saved lives. Dr Julian Lewis. Deputy Speaker, many patients in hospital will presumably be protected by their own uh, vaccination process uh, having been undertaken, but some will be clinically extremely vulnerable because of compromised immune systems. 
Is the Secretary of State saying that these people are at no greater risk of being made seriously ill or dying as a result of coming into contact with unvaccinated frontline staff? And if they are at greater risk, is there something else that can be done to lessen that risk, such as a, a testing regime before that contact takes place? Well, it's, a, it's a, another good question from my uh, honourable friend, and I will say two things. Is that first, this isn't about um, zero risk, it's about less risk, and what I am saying, uh, based on the advice that I have received, that in general, for the reasons I set out in my statement, whether someone is immunosuppressed or, 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 or not, that Omicron in general represents less risk. But he's also right to ask about whether other measures uh, could be taken to provide uh, additional support. And yes, they can. And that is why I have asked the NHS uh, to review its own policies uh, on the deployment of staff in certain settings, and that would include interaction with the most vulnerable patients. Clive Lewis. Thank you, Member Speaker. Can I, uh, first of all, thank the uh, Secretary of State for today's U-turn. I know that many of my constituents, um, both NHS staff uh, and patients, will be deeply grateful for it. Um, we all wanted to see as many NHS staff as possible take up the vaccine. Um, but no one wanted to see people forced to take the vaccine, especially after all that they have done for us. So can the Secretary of State promise the House that if there are future outbreaks, he will listen to the overwhelming body of public health evidence which says that carrot not stick, persuasion not enforcement, has better results when it comes to vaccine take up? Absolutely. <clears throat> Madam Deputy Speaker, this government will always uh, listen to the evidence, be guided by the evidence, as it has been today. Hugh Merriman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, unlike I see a number of my colleagues around here, I did actually vote in favour of these measures back in December. And I did so because I felt it was important for those that are going into hospital that they have the reassurance that those that are caring for them are fully protected. Now, I understand the Secretary of State's point that the matter has now changed. Uh, I regret that it is so, because I still felt my vote was the correct one. But can I ask him this specifically, just to assist me to get to the right place with him? He mentions that he asked for fresh advice uh, from the uh, health regulators, and no doubt they advised that this was no longer proportionate in these changed circumstances. Did that of itself precipitate a change in the legal position, that being one of the limbs for judicial review? So therefore, is there a legal requirement as to why we're having to change course as well? Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I do understand my honourable friend's question. The, the, it, it is when the evidence changes, or in this case, obviously, the, the, the change in the, the variant from Delta to, to Omicron, and, and then we, the ministers receive different advice, that advice always comes with up-to-date uh, legal analysis as well, and that legal analysis is certainly taken into account when making a decision. Paula Barker. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Like the honourable gentleman opposite, I too am angry. I am angry because in December last year, I twice asked the Secretary of State to pause and let us do this via consensus rather than mandation. The language we use in this place is extremely important, and the Secretary of State has spoken this evening about care workers and their choice to be sacked. What I would say is, they didn't choose to be sacked. Mm -hmm. This government chose not to give them appropriate PPE at the height of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. This government chose to discharge elderly patients yeah. into care homes at the height of this pandemic. Yeah. That is the real choice this government has made. Will the Secretary of State reevaluate? Will he go back and apologise to those care workers, some of the lowest paid in our labour markets, apologise to them? Will he ensure that they have continuity of service and pension contributions? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, where the Honourable Lady and I will absolutely uh, agree is on the service uh, that we have seen as a country from whether they're care home workers, domiciliary care workers, uh, over the pandemic. It has been the test of a lifetime for anyone working in that sector 
and each and every one of those people has risen to that challenge and provided the very best care they could have done in the most difficult of circumstances. And, and I'm sure that when, when, the, when the, the, the pandemic, as, as the Honourable Lady will know, there's an inquiry in the pandemic, I'm sure a lot of the issues will be looked at about, about whether uh, better support could or could not be provided under the circumstances. Uh, but uh, it, it is uh, important that we, looking ahead, we continue to do everything we can to continue to support this vital sector. Ben Bradley. Speaker, I welcome the decision uh, the Secretary of State has taken today, which is really important for the continuity and delivery of our services locally. We were faced with losing uh, over 3,000 health and care staff in Nottinghamshire alone uh, in a few weeks' time. This will take the pressure off massively come March, April time. Um, I'd urge him to go further if possible. I don't think it's fair to present the choice that care home workers made in November as having left by choice. And the truth is, we really need those staff and more if we're going to be able to implement the reforms that government is asking us to deliver on a local level rather than having to focus all of our energies on everyday firefighting. Uh, so will he uh, make a point and, uh, and perhaps change uh, the view he's stated so far, reach out to those staff and try and help them back into the sector uh, because we will need those people if we're going to be able to implement all the things he's asking in the care sector in the coming months? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Speaker, I, I agree with my old friend. Uh, the, as I said earlier, we, we, we need more people in care, we need more people in the NHS, we have a waiting list in, in, in both sectors, and uh, there, there are many people out there that will have uh, experience and want to do that, and, I, and he used the words, I think, we, can, can we work with the sector to, to reach out and, uh, uh, and, and support and uh, help um, uh, people to re-enter uh, the sector where they wish to do so. Of course we can, and, uh, and I think at the same time we can also uh, continue uh, to give any information uh, that, that may be helpful and necessary to help to persuade those that still remain unvaccinated uh, to make that positive choice and get vaccinated. Thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, my hospital trust, Imperial, has done its very best to care for staff over the past two years. Like other trusts, they found it very difficult to implement what was, until a few moments ago, the government's policy. But they did, both because it was good clinical practice to protect their patients and to give confidence to the general public. Why should I get vaccinated if my doctor won't? So what advice does the Secretary of State have for the hospitals and the care homes and their staff and ex-staff who may now feel betrayed? Well, I'd say two things, if I may, to that, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. That, you know, first, I would say to, to anyone involved in NHS Trust, uh, especially those uh, that were leading the campaign to encourage uh, their, their colleagues to, to get vaccinated, a, a huge thanks for what they've done and what they've achieved so far. Um, I mentioned earlier that since we consulted on the original regulations that 127,000 more people in the NHS across the NHS have, uh, have uh, been vaccinated, and that represents in total some 19 out of every 20 employees in the NHS, and that's a phenomenal uh, achievement. And, and, and the thanks goes to all those working in the NHS that has helped to make that happen and are still uh, helping to make that happen. Because my second thing I'd like to say to them is that your, 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 your work with our support, with the government support, my department support, uh, continues. And uh, d despite the changes today for the reasons that I've set out, uh, it is uh, still hugely important to, to get vaccinated and we must keep reaching out positively to those who have not yet, for whatever reason, chosen not to do so. So, but uh, helping them uh, to uh, make the right decision. Chris Green. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I uh, welcome my uh, right honourable friend's statement. Uh, and a number of times in it, he uh, made references to conditions of employment. And he finished uh, by referring to uh, asking regulators to urgently review current guidance to registrants on vaccinations. Uh, what is he going to do to ensure? that this does not become compul uh, compulsion for vaccinations by other means. Um, the, the regulator referred to our independent regulators, so all, all I can do is, is ask them 
to, to review uh, their regulations. Uh, my honourable friend might be aware that uh, some of the re uh, regulators, such as the GMC, already have uh, requirements against uh, uh, for, for vaccination in certain settings, and uh, that is a decision uh, for them. Uh, but as my honourable friend would uh, will, will will know that with uh, these independent regulators, uh, they will they usually would set out guidance and they would allow some flexibility in that how that guidance is interpreted in, in certain settings. Bob Seeley. Mr Speaker, I thank the Secretary of State on this decision. I, I did oppose uh, it in December for reasons eloquently laid out by members such as the Honourable Member for, for Broxbourne, although I was very respectful of the Government's position. But I think overall persuasion is better than coercion and frankly honesty is better than the manipulative games which we now hear that the nudge unit was playing, which were entirely counterproductive. Will the um, Secretary of State reassure me, now that we have some breathing space, can we do a bit of forward thinking and prepare a plan for this winter that protects the vulnerable, enables the NHS to continue to treat people, but does so without resorting to lockdowns? Because the idea that lockdown is a cost-free, risk-free option, as we've now seen from 100,000 children who've come off school rolls and disappeared, is absolutely untrue. Lockdown carries an extraordinarily heavy price, and frankly, a lot of the modelling behind it and forecasting has also been extremely flawed. Thank you. Um, what I will say to my honourable friend is that if we look at the experience from the uh, Omicron wave, that going into that wave, uh, in terms of um, actual restrictions on, on people's freedoms, we had the fewest restrictions of any large country in Europe yet we've been the first country to, to come out of the Omicron wave and hit the peak. And, uh, and the reason uh, I believe that has happened, the main reason, is because we rightly focused on pharmaceutical defences, vaccines in particular, of course, uh, antivirals and testing. And I think there's a lot to be learned from that. Final question, Steve Baker. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Though we may have arrived here by different routes, I'm very grateful that today my right honourable friend and I agree on this uh, policy area. Of course, we also agree that uh, vaccination is the better choice for everybody for whom it, it is safe, they don't have a pre-existing condition. But could I just pick up the issue of language? Because he's used a range of tones about talking about people. He's used some quite soft language about persuasion, and we've heard a range of perspectives about it. But he's also used some very strident language, which my honourable friend for Broxbourne, I think, I think rightly criticised. Could I ask him to just set out for the House what his attitude is to this issue of bodily autonomy and using the law to compromise it? And if he does respect people's bodily autonomy, could I ask him to please select language which is respectful of that choice? Yes, I mean, I, I think my honourable friend is, uh, is... I mean, first of all, I, I'm pleased that we agree on, on what's being set out today. But I think he's absolutely right to, to, to raise what he said in the, in the way that he has, because language is, is vitally important, in, especially on issues of, of, of this great significance, when you are asking people uh, to, to you know, inject themselves with something, to, to put a needle to themselves, and, and to get vaccinated for all the right reasons. And of course, there will be some people, for whatever their reason, they will be more resistant uh, than others uh, to that, have some kind of hesitancy, and it's our duty to work with them. And I hope, I know actually, I, I, I'm sure that my honourable friend agrees with me, that when you reach for statute when it, uh, it, it, in vaccination, there, there would need to be a very, very, very high bar. He's heard me say at this dispatch box, I think more than once, that I would never support universal vaccination, any kind of statute, and, and the, the, this policy I've talked about today uh, required a very high bar to reach. At the time we introduced the policy, I believe that that bar was reached for the reasons I've set out about protecting vulnerable people. Now I believe it will be disproportionate, and that's why I've set this out today. But what hasn't changed is the importance of vaccination for those people who can get vaccinated because uh, yeah, they're not medically uh, exempt from it for some reason, then we should continue to work together across this House to encourage them to do so and work with them in the most positive way possible, because not only it, it, will they be better off, but we would all be better off. I thank the Secretary of State um, for his statement, and we now come to the Advanced Research and Invention Agency <laughs> Bill. Ways and Means motion. Minister to move. 
The question is the Ways and Means motion as on the order paper. Is the honourable gentleman indicating that he wants to speak on? No, sorry. Not right. Thank you. The question is the Ways and Means motion as on the order paper. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Programme motion to be moved formally. I beg to move. The question is as on the order paper. As many as of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Advanced Research and Invention Agency Bill. Consideration of Lords' Amendments. Now. I must draw the House's attention to the fact that financial privilege is engaged by Lords' Amendments 1, 12 and 14. If the House agrees to any of these Lords' Amendments, I shall ensure that the appropriate <coughs> entry is made in the journal. We begin with the Government's motion to disagree with Lords' Amendments 1, with which it will be convenient to consider the Lords' Amendments 2 to 15. I call Minister George Freeman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I, I beg to move that this House disagrees with the Lords in their Amendment 1. I am, however, delighted that the bill to create this exciting new agency has returned to this House and that I am able to speak to it today for the first time in my role as Minister for Science, Research and Innovation. I would like to pay tribute to my ministerial colleague, Lord Callanan, for his work on the bill in the other place, not for the first time in matters scientific. Their lordships at the other end uh, have held our minister uh, very busy on the front bench, and also to my honourable friend, the member for Derby North, who so capably led this bill through when it was first before the House. There are 15 amendments for our consideration tonight. 14 of those were brought forward and supported by or supported by the government, and I'll summarise them very quickly. Amendments 2 to 8 relate to changes the government made in response to the Delegated Powers and Regulatory Reform Committee's report on the bill. And in doing so, we've demonstrated the seriousness with which we take the DPRRC's recommendations and the government's commitment to acting upon them. The effect of these amendments is to omit Clause 10 of the bill, which contained a broader power to make consequential provision, and replace it with a narrower and more specific power in Clause 8. The new power can only be used in consequence of regulations dissolving ARIA. Other amendments are needed to tidy up the rest of the bill and reflect this change. I hope these changes are, in general, welcome. Amendments 9 and 10 remove a power for ARIA to pay pensions and gratuities determined by the Secretary of State to non-executive members. We have tested this thoroughly and are content that, in ARIA's specific case, that power is not needed. Again, these two amendments reflect the usual process of improving the bill in response to scrutiny and the expertise that colleagues here and, if I may say in particular, in the other place have brought to bear. Moving now to amendments 11 and 13, Madam Deputy Speaker, which remove the amendments previously included in the bill that had the effect of reserving ARIA. I have had productive discussions on this with my ministerial colleagues in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland to reiterate the importance of ARIA and our broader science policy to help strengthen the Union. I am delighted that they share my vision and ambition for ARIA and that we have reached an agreement on the independence of ARIA, a memorandum of understanding which is a shared commitment to safeguard the organisation's most important characteristics and which means the reservations are not needed. I am delighted to be able to report that legislative consent motions have been passed in all three devolved legislatures on the basis of this agreement, and I similarly commend it to the House. The last Government amendments are Amendments 12, 14 and 15. These apply some relevant obligations to ARIA that would normally apply automatically to public authorities listed in the FOI Act. The amendments provide for ARIA to be treated as a public authority for the purposes of the Data Protection Act 2018, the Income Tax, Earnings and Pensions Act 2003, the Enterprise Act 2016 and the Small Business Enterprise and Employment Act 2015, and amend various regulations and the UK GDPR to reflect this. This ensures ARIA is treated in the same way as a public organisation normally would in these important areas. I'll happily give way. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful, and he will know that in the previous discussions this question of freedom of information had come up before. Wouldn't it be much simpler just to make ARIA uh, subject to the Freedom of Information Act? And in the current climate, wouldn't that reassure the public? Uh, well, it may reassure the public, but we also have to take into consideration the importance of to succeed, ARIA world-class scientists recruited here to lead in cutting-edge science can be sure that they won't be tied up, it's a very small staff, in answering 
101 often spurious freedom of information requests from the media who are keen on running stories. So we want to make sure this agency is accountable properly, but not uh, to be bogged down in what can be, Madam Deputy Speaker, hugely onerous freedom of information requests. So in that connection, could he give the House some, some brief guidance on what he as the accountable minister would expect by way of discussion and influence over corporate plans and budgets and onward reporting to the House? I'm grateful to my honourable friend, right honourable friend, for uh, that question. It's one that he will uh, not be surprised to know that I've been asking myself since coming to this role. The uh, point of ARIA, of course, Madam Deputy Speaker, is to be a new agency for doing new science in new ways, and it's been structured specifically to avoid meddling ministers, even those with a good idea, and meddling officials, even those with good intent, and to create an agency that is free. But my right honourable friend asks the important question. Uh, as we appoint the CEO and the chair as the framework agreement, which will set out, a bit like a subscription agreement, the operating parameters of the agency is uh, in due course published, then each year ARIA will have to report on uh, its own stated plans. And crucially, and I know he'll be reassured by this, uh, as is so often not the case in scientific endeavour, report where uh, happy failure has occurred so that we don't continue to pour more money into scientific programmes that have not succeeded. And we want ARIA to be free, to be honest about that and not embarrassed, uh, and to be able to announce that. And, and that will be annually accountable through the framework agreement. Uh, finally, Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to return to Amendment 1, which deals with the conditions ARIA may attach to its financial support. Uh, this arose from a series of important discussions in the other place relating to the duty of ARIA to commercialise IP that may be generated, which I'm keen to address properly. However, the amendment as drafted does not actually permit or prevent ARIA from doing anything. It adds conditions, examples of conditions that ARIA may attach to financial support, but ARIA already has the general power to do just that. So it therefore represents legally simply a drafting change, and as such we can't accept it. But we do understand and acknowledge the importance of the point that the noble Lord Lord Brown had in mind when tabling this amendment, which I wanted to speak to. It's, <coughs> excuse me, it is our firm belief that, whilst it is not appropriate at this stage uh, in legislation to specify ARIA's contracting and granting arrangements to be spelled out, we do recognise the importance of substance of the concerns that underlie this, am this amendment, namely that ARIA ha should have a duty to the taxpayer to ensure that it is not uh, hemorrhaging intellectual property of value to the UK. And I will come in a moment to outline our position on those. The amendment focuses principally on overseas acquisition of IP uh, relating to the principles on which the government intervenes in foreign takeovers of UK businesses, particularly where those businesses have benefited from public investment in R&D activities. And Madam Deputy Speaker, as you will be aware, the National Security and Investment Act, which fully commenced earlier this month, provides just such a framework. It marks the biggest upgrade of investment screening in the UK for 20 years. The NSI Act covers relevant sectors such as quantum technologies and synthetic biology that have benefited from significant public investment and permits the government to scrutinise acquisitions on national security grounds. This new investment screening regime supports the UK's world-leading reputation for being an attractive place to invest. It has been debated extensively in both houses and very recently, and we do not believe that revisiting those debates today would be productive. Whilst the NSI Act provides a statutory framework, there is also a much broader strand of work underway. As the Science Minister, I take very seriously, as you would expect, the security of our academic and research community. And there have been a number of measures taken in the last few months to strengthen our protections uh, and over the last two years. We are working closely with the sector to help it identify and address risks from overseas collaborations while supporting academic freedom of thought and institutional independence. Uh, members in that, here this evening will not need me to tell them that Intellectual property is incredibly valuable, and we face increasingly both sovereign and industrial espionage. And it's important that we are able to support our universities in uh, being aware of those risks and supporting them in avoiding them. The bill already contains a broad power of direction for the Secretary of State over ARIA on issues of national security, and that provides a strong mechanism to intervene in ARIA's activities in the unlikely event it's necessary to do so. I'll have to give way. The, the Minister uh, for giving way, and obviously welcome him to the dispatch box in relation to, to this bill. Just, just to get my own head around this, he 
think he, he's saying that ARIA can do this, so the government doesn't need to legislate in that regard, but the government would nonetheless be quite keen to see ARIA do it. There seems to be a little bit of a discrepancy in terms of the thought process there, as far as I... Um, uh, no discrepancy. I, I, I will in a moment explain why, but essentially the bill already provides for and uh, lays out a statutory responsibility of ARIA to generate economic return for the UK. And he will know, uh, as I have, having had a career negotiating intellectual property agreements, that at this stage it would be wholly inappropriate to mandate statutorily the, f the form in which ARIA, uh, those intellectual property agreements would take. Uh, to be blunt, we don't yet know what programmes uh, the chair and chief executive will put in place. And uh, it's only when we know the sort of science that ARIA is doing that we would possibly be in a position through the framework agreement to set out the appropriate ways to make sure that value is maximised. Uh, the uh, consideration of security issues will also be a core consideration in ARIA's governance arrangements in the framework agreement to ensure its effective functioning as an organisation. I can confirm for colleagues today that the framework document which deals with those issues will include obligations on ARIA to work closely with our national security apparatus. Uh, and this is prudent to ensure both ARIA's research is protected from hostile states uh, and actors and to stay connected to the government's wider agenda on strategic technological advantage. The government's chief scientist, who will be on the ARIA board, will bring intelligence and expertise across security issues within government, supported by the new Office for uh, Science and Technology and the National Science and Technology uh, Council. And ARIA will, of course, have internal expertise in order to advise ARIA's board and programme managers, while also working with the recipients of ARIA's funding in universities and businesses on research-specific security issues. Uh, I do believe this will be vital for ARIA to stay at the forefront of responding to the challenging nature of the UK's interests in this area. There is also the question of how ARIA responds to the UK's strategic interests in science and technology more generally, where they may not quite fall under the national security umbrella. The integrated review, the creation of the new OSTC uh, and the National Council for Science and Technology, on which I sit, outline our ambition to ensure a serious strategic machinery of government commitment to strategic industrial advantage of UK science and technology. This is a fundamental priority both for me and for the government more broadly. And ARIA is, of course, nestled within that structure and is required to be aware of all of those priorities. But we must keep its role in perspective. It is only a small, will only be a small part of the landscape in which we're explicitly seeking to make independent of government and free to explore new funding approaches. The whole point of ARIA is to be a new agency to do new science in new ways. I'm grateful to the Minister. And, uh, he's been admirably blunt about keeping interfering ministers and interfering officials uh, from controlling or influencing ARIA. But there is also influence from the scientific establishment uh, who have got their own programmes and would like uh, the sums of money uh, in ARIA to go into their 